the whole football stadium is packed, sold out. <laughs> Woo! It's coming your way. Welcome everybody to Hitting the High Spots with Rob Naylor, Dave Meltzer, and Chris Hero, part dose. We are going to just again go off to numerous different places in professional wrestling with probably my two favorite people to talk <laughs> about pro wrestling with because obscurity is the word of the day and we got plenty of it for you here today. Dave, how you doing? I'm doing great. I'm glad to be here. All right, Chris, what's up? I'm awesome, man. What Bola night one last night. Bola night one was last night to yeah. date this thing. It was last night. It was awesome. We enjoyed it thoroughly. Uh, let's just bring up the first topic, and it's going to be Ron Reese. Because what else would it be? <laughs> Dave Meltzer. Let's talk about Ron Reese. To, just a timeout to prompt this. A week ago, uh, Rob and I were sending text messages and. The subject of Ron Reese came up, and Important he goes, stuff. "Hold on, call me." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I'm like, "That's the first time in the history of the universe that anyone has ever stopped to go, oh, we need to have an immediate conversation about Ron Reese, Ron Reese. including Ron Reese's family. <laughs> it's never, it's never happened before ever." I needed to talk about Ron Reese, and here's why: there, there were numerous giants, large men in this business. I mean, Nitron, Butch Masters, the Giant Warrior, and I'm talking about tertiary giants, not the big names like Andre or the Giant or any of these other folks. Every but territory needed a giant. Every damn territory needed a giant, and they needed uh, Brickhouse Brown if you talk to Bill Watts, apparently. But here's the thing. The Giants, the vanilla gorilla Ron Reese took superplexes, he made Goldberg look like a complete world beater going up for all the big moves and get thrown around. The guy was awesome. Why didn't Ron Reese make it bigger? What what when did his career end? I don't have a, a final match date on Ron Reese, but maybe you could supply well, me with you know, it. Okay, so so did Bring you ever, did you ever hear the story about William Regal and, and Big Show? I have not. Okay, so William, William Regal goes to Big Show and you know when, when Big Show's on top and he just goes In WCW. In w, this is WCW. Yeah. You know, like uh whatever, yeah. And he just goes he just goes you know, in Big Show, I guess, I don't know if he was getting cocky. I don't know what it was that, that led to this. And William Regal goes, there's only one thing, the, the, the only difference between you and Ron Reese, or or, or maybe he yeah. used a different name, but, but um, you know, the Yeti. It wasn't the Yeti, because he only was that for one, one day. But the Yeti. The only, the only difference is that you got the push and he didn't, mm -hmm. you know. But, I mean, I, you know, I, as, I, as I've talked to you about, I knew of Ron Reese from high school because he grew up where I grew up. And he was, the thing that where, where I knew of him is that, that he was a wrestling fan. He was like a huge pro wrestling fan. It was a little bit when he was in high school. I heard, oh yeah, Ron Reese is, you know, was a basketball basketball star, was a was a wrestling fan. But then when he was in college at Santa Clara, he told everyone he was his big wrestling fan. John Studd was his favorite. Him and John Studd ended up being uh, being mm -hmm. buddies. So I knew that he was gonna. If he didn't play in the NBA, and I don't remember if he did or didn't. I mean, he was right I, on I don't, the, I don't think so, because I've, I've never heard of that. He was borderline. I mean, because yeah. he, he was a really good, yeah. he was a star college player. Mm -hmm. um, but, the, but the thing was, he was going to go in, and he was going to be Big Ron Studd. He was going to be the, the son or protege of John yeah. Studd. And he was, and you know, he was seven foot two, and he yeah. was 300 pounds or whatever it was. I mean, we thought, no, no doubt he was going to make it, because... Guys smaller than him were, yeah. were, were that weren't athletic were, were successful giants, but whatever it was, timing or I don't even know. I couldn't tell you why it didn't happen. It just sucks. It's super giant, of, super giant ninja or something. Super giant. You remember Super Giant Ninja? You did this very briefly. Yeah, Which you worked? reported on it. Super yeah. Giant Ninja, in 1995 or six, folks, was going to be in the World War Three battle. Remember, they needed a giant, and Gonzalez could. Jorge yeah. couldn't come over, yeah. so they needed and three Gonzalez, guys. Gonzalez, I think, was supposed to be the original Yeti. Yeah. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> wow, imagine yeah. the world and how it would change if the Yeti was the giant Gonzalez. Maybe, and maybe his, his body his, suit... Yeah, it would be maybe, white. Maybe he like was in a fire, <laughs> and his body suit, you know, he was burned, so he had to wrap himself wrap up. Wrap himself <laughs> up. Uh, streamers and oh, the man, the Yeti. Yeti. Jorge uh, and so I wanted to seg into this, because this... I thought Reese was kind of underappreciated because, um, you know, I, maybe he just didn't show enough of his own stuff, but he was always good at taking things like him and Goldberg. I mean, he'd go up straight for the jackhammer and he'd fly around and I always thought he was a good, good match for the flock. 
Uh, so that made me think about the flock. And I just, I think as a faction, I think they kind of get swept under the rug because everybody romanticizes the original flock in ECW. But I thought the WCW flock was, was awesome because Kidman, Kidman, Saturn, Raven are all awesome guys. And then all the other tertiary yeah, guys. The, uh, you know, Six Hammer, Scotty, Scotty, Rick, Rick, yeah. Scotty Lodi, Riggs with the eye. Lodi Lodi with the side. Like, I just thought it was such a good mix of everything. Good. And it saved Raven from having to put everybody over because his guys could just get beat up and the fans were happy. Yeah. So I just, I, what, what do you think of the flock as a, as a faction? I mean, it was, there, was, time. There, was so, there was so much going on there, and they were always just like, they were just like, you know, there were all those guys that were like part of the show, and they were all, you know, I, I mean, I, they were all good at, at, yeah. at being their little role in the show. I, I always thought, was Sick Boy the one who I always thought like Scott was, was, was better Vick. than he ever got a shot mm -hmm. to be? I remember that one. I, I recently watched a Scott Vitt versus Steve Bradley dark match. I was about to bring up <laughs> Steve Bradley myself. It's so random. Steve. Oh, so I, I found out an interesting thing last night. Uh, the Super 8 from 1999. Um, Reckless Youth was supposed to be in it, and I believe he got injured. So that's how they brought in Steve Bradley, Jeff Hardy, and Matt Hardy, who were all in developmental at the time. Mm -hmm. And they did the Super 8 that year, and then the finals was Bradley beating Christopher Daniels in the finals. And it was supposed to be Reckless. Reckless and Daniels in the finals of the Super wow. 8 with Reckless getting his win. Because he never, he never won. I mean, he was king of the independents, yeah. but he never... You know, he was held with reverence, but then it was always putting someone else over in a certain situation. Steve Bradley. I'm going to go to Bradley to someone else and then back to the faction thing because I have three different yeah. thoughts. I'll say this. Steve Bradley, numerous people have told me the best guy that didn't make it that should have. Mm -hmm. uh, I always heard that too. Pierre Carl Olette recently did an interview with Devin Nicholson, and they're really good interviews on YouTube. You can get them for free, but they're awesome. But... uh I love PCO. I love uh, I love the Quebecers. I was a huge fan of of Pierre. Uh, what was his name? In Jean Pierre Lafitte. Jean Pierre Lafitte. I thought that he was insanely underrated. Maybe quirky behind the I, scenes. I don't I, understand when why. When I was I doing uh, explosion matches at TNA, he came X. in as X. He was awesome. X was <laughs> and he, awesome and he, in TNA. And he did the package pile driver, which he got yes. from a young Kevin Steen. Yes, because yeah. you could see in the early Quebecers squash matches in 93 in the summertime, Jacques would do the package pile driver, and then uh, Pierre would do the flipping leg drop, both moves that Kevin Steen then later did. So I, I, I love the influence on them. But I, uh, Pierre was saying how when they did those camps with uh, Dory and Tom, mm -hmm. That basically everybody was like, yo, Steve Bradley is going to be the guy. And that just you know, didn't really yeah. work out. Uh, back to the faction thing. I remember when they had uh, Braun Strowman. They had uh, Bray Wyatt, obviously Rowan and, and Big Luke. And they were the faction. I always felt they needed a Buddy Roberts or a Kidman or a guy to take bumps. Part of the reason, in my opinion, that the Wyatts haven't gotten over is because they have all these big guys. But they're just all bumping. And, and aside from Braun... But like these guys just getting thrown around, they're not really protected as much as they should be, in my opinion. So I always felt, and I remember Sammy Callahan, we lived in Orlando at the same time, right before he quit, but he had pitched to be with them because Wyndham was a fan, and then I pitched to someone that I still knew from, I was long gone at this point, but I pitched to someone like, hey, they need a Buddy Roberts to take all the bumps, and then you protect the bigger guys a little more. And to me, that would have been such a great little natural you know, you, fit. That was a really interesting thing you just said, because it, it's like, Luke Harper, in a lot of ways, was too good for his own good. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And, 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 and you know what? That may have been the same case with Reese. Yeah. Because the giants that got over, they weren't taking superplexes. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, they were just standing there, and yeah. maybe it was... You know, I mean, nobody called his number. I mean, that's yeah, the, yeah. the big thing. But, you know, in some ways where, where you can do all that stuff, but, you know, maybe it's not to your benefit to be doing it. Ironically, when Luke Harper had his tryout, interesting story in my opinion, uh... Dusty liked the big man to just be mobile and not take bumps. Yeah. He liked the big John Studd in Florida, the big guy who would just be kind of bashing you and destroying you and not falling. So Luke Harper in his tryout, it was me, Dusty, and Joey Mercury in the room watching it in the big screen. Harper hit a big drop kick. And Mercury, who's usually brilliant as far as knowing what to say to Dusty, just goes, oh, the big man, look how agile he is. And Dream's like... Man, motherfucker shouldn't even leave his feet that size. And I was like, oh no. Because, like, yeah. it ended up being like, oh. Yeah, but the drop kick's not bad, though. It's yeah. a beautiful drop yeah, kick. Yeah, no, no, that's what I mean. I mean, it's, it's like, 
it's like it's one thing to like be bumping, bumping, yeah. bumping all over the place, but the yeah. but throwing the drop kick out of nowhere for a big guy, I think, is a great spot. See, I like both. Like it's the John Studd, Jerry Blackwell theory. I like a big man that'll go up and bounce but all Jerry, around. Jerry Blackwell was doing drop kicks too. Sure, though. and he did a drop kick, but like John Studd was the more mobile. John Studd one. didn't. <laughs> can, can I uh, chip in with? It has really nothing to do with this, but he just brought up uh, uh, Blackwell. It has nothing to do with this, so keep your train of thought. Uh, I, I recently purchased a uh, compilation of Missing Link matches. Oh, really? Because uh, he's always um, fascinated me. and So I ended up finding his uh, uh, some Mid-South stuff when he was Max the Missing Link with just like a shit stripe of black paint across his <laughs> with, face. With, with Dark Journey? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So there was, a, there was a situation that was happening and there was a brawl and there was Crusher Blackwell and whatever. And then like... Blackwell went out into the crowd. It seemed like a studio taping of sorts. and The boys uh, club maybe. Yeah, yeah B- Blackwell smashed someone out of a chair, a fan. And like grabbed the grabbed the chair like he was going to hit the guy. And it looked like a real altercation. And then someone, someone else, it, seemingly from the crowd, reached up and grabbed the chair to pull it away from him. And I looked and it was Sapphire. Sweet Sapphire. Juanita Wright. Yeah. There you go. And I'm like... Is okay, the... so that's probably Kansas City. Or yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, maybe this was even before... It was on the... It's probably Kansas City. Yeah, maybe this was Dewey Robertson oh, in the maybe... match with Crusher Black. Oh, okay, so Dewey, Dewey Robertson. The same, so the same DVD. But I'm just like, what is going on? And then also, <laughs> they took Blackwell and smashed his head into the ring post, right? And he just turns around and, and looks at him. Did, yeah, right, right, right. What?! He yeah. would nail. He would take a board and a nail and try to headbutt the nail just, into the it board. It was so funny. That was the whole thing. Was the gimmick was the head. Yeah, yeah. Bang, yeah. bang your head. I yeah. love. I yeah. love Blackwell. Here's the thing. I love Blackwell. Like if I was a wrestler, check it. I would just eat all the food ever and just be the big fat guy wrestler yeah. and like take the the Kamala one man gang, Jerry Blackwell. Oh, I'm almost falling. Yokozuna was great with it. Oh, the the, the awesome. psychology of a match with a big man. And again, I love Bam Bam Bigelow and Vader and the guys who go up for stuff too. But I just love the big match, the, 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 the psychology of just hitting them and hitting them. And then, oh shit, they fell. And then the big tree goes down and everyone, you know. You know, you know Jerry, Jerry Blackwell it. was really a hell of a worker. I watched awesome. like, like Jerry, Jerry Blackwell with, um, um, with various partners, Patera and Sheik and all that mm-hmm. against Gagne and Brunzel. And I mean, like I remember like how great Jerry Blackwell was at working with Greg Gagne because you're talking about... You know, Greg was kind of a skinny guy in that era where people kind of, like, if you were in the Midwest AWA and you grew up with the Ganyas, it was no problem. Mm-hmm. But when they came to San Francisco and, and, and yeah. we didn't grow up with Greg Gagne, and you see the skinny guy getting, you know, and, and all that, it was a little bit hard for a lot of the fans at first, especially when he was getting such a big push. But I remember we would watch him with, with Blackwell, and Blackwell sold so well for him that it was just like, um, he really got Greg yeah. Gagne over for, for like the West Coast fans. Yeah. yeah so just, just back to factions, I think the best factions are ones that can be represented all the way up through the card. You've got a tag team, you've got a mid-level guy, and you've got a main guy. Not that they all have to be active at the same time, but then you just, it, the problem is it ends up influencing the whole card, and then you have four entrances in the same show for the same people, but I, I just like that how the diversity could be. You can have different tags, six mans, etc. I think every heel faction should have like the utility guy that could get the heat like and lose the match and then they can retain it by yeah. having someone else. They do that match. a lot in Japan, not mm-hmm. necessarily with factions, but yeah. they'll have these six man matches with all these heavy hitters. And then the one guy. Yeah. But, but it's, it's almost sometimes it's, it's sometimes with Japan, especially now yeah. with, with as, as smart as fans are, it almost like leads to too much predictability. Yeah. Yeah, but but the but yeah, absolutely but I do think that uh, we were discussing this last night about how guys can get over by losing but how they lose so like on all the you know, I've been on you know a hundred Noah shows or whatever they would always have these six mans and you'd see it and you'd go okay that guy's gonna beat that guy right so you, you know it's a foregone conclusion but sometimes they would do it in such a way that all oh, he yeah. need, all he needs is a big kick out and people to go oh and, then, and, then, and that then, feeling then, that they get, they remember that the next time the young boy comes to the ring. So he's inching his way up. Yeah, he's well, not just getting squashed, not just getting beat. Yeah, but I mean that's that's one of the things like with Yoshihashi, who's a yeah. little bit above that now. But but certainly like with New Japan, yeah. they'll have those those guys where um, yeah, it, it, it's you know that they're going to lose the fall, mm-hmm. but you know it, it, it it's like you you also know they're going to be stars down the line and yeah. you you just want to see them take that step yeah. and when it's yeah. a slow step it's a good story yeah yeah 
I like overheard it. yesterday, ironically, talking about the smaller guy in a match, match with a big guy. Uh, Leon Weider, Vader, back in the day, he teamed up with like Buzz Sawyer and someone else against like Tony Sinclair, Jushin Liger, and somebody else. So Liger and Buzz were doing their thing. But even Vader would get in with Liger, and that was like a real fun little deal back in like 90 or 91. You know when Liger kicked over the, the helmet? Yes! Total shoot. <laughs> Vader had no clue it was coming. Wow. Really? Liger just goes, hey, fuck your helmet. Liger kicking the helmet over if you haven't seen it, guys. <laughs> GIF it. GIFs are hot these days. Somebody yeah. please GIF that wow. thing. Uh, but yeah, so I just I thought it was interesting because there's Will Ospreay telling a Vader story with Liger in the vicinity. And I just I thought back to thinking about like Vader had a big issue, or maybe he had a big issue, but he, he took umbrage with Ricochet and Ospreay, which is a match I love, but I get different strokes for different folks. But Vader thought it was just like glorified calisthenics. I found it intriguing that like Vader got Two Cold Scorpio in the business, and Two Cold Scorpio yeah. was like he helped him get everywhere, yeah. and he loved Two Cold Scorpio. Yeah. So like I found it weird that like Vader think, didn't remember Scorpio think, and Pegasus doing a lot of the same kind of. Yeah, I think that a lot of that may have just been he saw that one spot, and then like because a lot of people they saw that one spot, and mm-hmm. then it was just like it was so gymnastic. Yeah. There, was, there was no context to it. Right, yeah. they didn't know that. Osprey is a guy that grew up idolizing Ricochet, and once he got into wrestling, it was like, oh, so they were emulating yeah. each other, and it was just obviously in a fight, you're you're not going to look at each other and then both go hit the ropes and handspring. But it wasn't that they were trying to hit each other with something. It's just like, I got you, you got me, I got you, you got me, and then rah, boom, it's just that showmanship of wow, mm-hmm. like yeah. what a like it, it it doesn't have to be an offensive or a defensive maneuver. It's just that showing out of and, yeah. and he saw it with no context. Yeah. He ah, it's gymnastics. Probably didn't give it a second thought. Yeah. And then once the traffic started coming in and people started saying things, he thinks, you know, he's a he's a wrestler in the back of his brain. So he goes, oh, well, maybe we can make some business out of this. And I, I was there. I or was, maybe he got maybe he just got defensive because yeah, because, oh, oh, absolutely. Because, because, because of, think about this too. You're being told by fans. That you're an idiot, and like you've been told by fans that you're an idiot, you're gonna go like, I'm not an idiot, you know. But he may have been wrong in that situation, but yeah. you're you're gonna just go in there and just you're gonna double down on your yeah. thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's one of those things where it's so easy to get out of touch in wrestling. Uh, we had this conversation oh, yeah. a while ago about like you take six months off and you come back. Your finger's not on the pulse. Have I, have I ever told you guys the Bill Watts story? I've heard it, but let's let's. You've heard the story. I love it. Okay, so so Bill Watts. So Bill Watts sold his company in '87, mm-hmm. and he came back in '92. Um, and for all that time, you know, in WCW, everyone's going like, you know, Bill Watts as a as a booker, as a creative mind in the '80s, he was the guy. Mm-hmm. And it, you know, WCW was floundering with this guy and this guy. And then finally, you know, after all these years, it's like they they hire Bill Watts, and it's like. This is so great. So he, so they hire Bill Watts, and I'm on the. He, he called me up, and we go through everything. And it was not a conversation. It was Bill Watts talking to me for two straight hours, and I had a, a few words here and there, and you know, I barely asked a question. I maybe asked like one question that was an hour, second question that was another hour. So Bill's just going through everything, and when it's over, it was like, oh my god, yeah. like, like it's like wrestling, you know. And I didn't think because I'd been watching it for the whole five years. Yeah, yeah. So wrestling's really changed in five years. And Bill has not watched any wrestling in five years. Yeah. And it's like everyone everyone is at the level they were five years ago. And the fans were at the level of five years ago. And it like really scared me. And I remember like right, I got off the phone and I called up Brian Pillman and I go, Brian, this isn't gonna work. <laughs> and it's like, you know, and it could have been in time because Bill was a genius, yeah. but but he, he had he had to catch up. Yeah. And then he did the top rope thing, which, oh, you know, man, I mean, yeah. you know how bad that, that came off. I mean, he, yeah. and I know, like, he had his reasons for it and all that because Vern did that in the 60s. I, in I, the I can understand throwing someone over the top rope as in a way that that gets heat. That could be a DQ, but banning top, that's like but, a babyface thing. Why would you take away, okay, guys, no babyface comebacks. Yeah. You know, it's illegal to do a, a bump feed. Don't have that. <laughs> guys, sorry. But, and especially when, like, the, the, the whole thing is, is that's when Liger was coming yeah. up. Yeah. And it's like, Liger's coming up and you're banning top rope moves, and yeah. it's just kind of like, yeah. and they wanted to push the junior heavyweight yeah. division. What they should have done is they should have added a fourth rope. And then <laughs> oh, everybody is just jumping off the, the third rope. The fourth rope. rope. Teddy the Hart, fourth... don't listen to this. <laughs> oh, shit. The, we're going to have this debut the, next month. The fourth rope. The fourth <laughs> rope. You know uh, what he could have done? But yeah, it still wouldn't have worked. Is it, is one of those things where you have like a junior heavyweight rules and you mm-hmm. can do the top ropes. Mm-hmm. But because at least it gives them something different. Yeah. But, but. You know, I wouldn't have done, but you yeah. couldn't because people had seen top rope. Once Jimmy Snooker did the top rope stuff, you can't take that away yeah. anymore because that was like that was like too babyface of a spot. Yeah. 
Like when he was in AWA, and so Ray Stevens was doing the top rope move, but he was a heel. Yeah. So you're taking away heel move yeah. because he could kill somebody. Yeah. yeah that was yeah. the whole thing. Yeah. Like, Watts was so good with presentation, but I remember, like, Super Bowl 92, you have Liger-Pillman, classic match. And then Super Bowl 93, it's uh, Pegasus and Scorpio. And I think that one had no off the top. It's still an excellent match, but nothing off the top, so it's just a, a little bit different. Uh, shoot. Okay, Give us so, a topic, Chris. Um, everybody knows about hulking up, right? You, it would, Hogan had the same pattern for all his matches, and it worked for, for most all of them. He would end up taking the guy's finish... He would kick out and he would pop up and, and nothing would hurt him, nothing would hurt him. Shoot him off, big boot, leg drop or whatever, right? So that's like hulking up, which, uh, you know, that that's how we refer to it. Oh, you're hulking up. But it was a similar thing from Chief J Strongbow, is that correct? Strongbow? Well, the war dance? Just, yeah, and all of a sudden, hey, it doesn't hurt me anymore. Hey, well, Jackie well, Fargo, then, too. Yeah. Um, well, well, Hogan may have got it. Um, in, in the AWA at first, because that's where he first made it as a babyface. So yeah. it's probably from Bruiser and Crusher. Okay. Because if you ever watch the Bruiser stuff, they would run the Bruiser's head into the turnbuckle, and then that's when he would start his big comeback. Mm -hmm. And the, and they would do the thing where the guys would start hitting the Crusher and the Bruiser, and they would yeah. just stand there. Or you would try to whip them, and they would just stand there, like yeah. the Nakanishi spot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and I think that it may have been, because because Byrne really booked Hogan like he used to book Crusher. Mm -hmm. You know, like just the same pattern, other than... He would beat Crusher once a year, and he never beat Hogan. Yeah, you know, but but um, so I think that that's it. You know, Waller did the same thing mm -hmm. too. You know, mm -hmm. where where he would sit, you know, may, you know, be just about down and out and do the strap and the strap. Yeah, I, I was just wondering where the origin of that came from. Of, I mean, it's it sounds like such a silly thing because we what we know about wrestling now that we didn't know back then. It's like, hey man, I got a great idea. Give me all your shit, and I'm not. I'm just gonna not sell it. And then come back, and then I'm gonna beat you with my move. What do you think? Because it, it just seems like such a. It, it it's got to be suggested from a person of authority because it can't be like, hey man, let's do this match and let's do all my stuff and none of yours. <laughs> it just because that's not how how it works. But it's got to be someone telling him, hey man, this is how we're gonna get you over. We want you to do this. Well, I mean, it was, it was probably burned because that's how yeah. that's how the Crusher and the Bruiser got over. Interesting, interesting. So. Um, I had another thought, and it's it's already gone. So I remember Sasha Banks when she was trying to find her niche in NXT. I would assume in 2013, she just needed something at the time. She yeah. wasn't the boss yet, obviously. Yeah. But I remember the idea was for a moment in the match to come toward the end where someone hits her, and she goes, "Oh hell no!" And then like she yeah. just went at it, and Sarah Del Rey was like, "No, no, 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 no!" And like she was, we were so upset because it was so, we, we yeah. talked about, "Oh, that'll be your thing." And then she's like, "Yeah." And then like Sarah's like, "Nope, cursing hell." So then like it got cut uh -huh. but like I loved in the recent match with Charlotte at SummerSlam mm -hmm. she totally reverted back to yeah. that spot maybe not oh hell no yeah. but then had that moment where she just yeah. like went nuts on her I was like yeah there it is because, like three years later because that's what it's gotta be it's gotta be you have that, that uh, light switch yeah you, I've, I've take in the Popeye I've, I've take all mm -hmm. I've taken I can't takes no more or whatever and then there's gotta be something because that's what people are watching just Oh man, I'm. I can see myself in this situation. I guess what would I want to do if I'm in that situation? And it's not like, oh, I'd like to reverse a suplex on that guy. It's like, no, no, I want to get pushed to the point where I can't get pushed anymore, and I'm gonna give everything I have. Yeah. I'm gonna throw it all out. That's what fighting spirit is. Yeah. Everybody gets this uh, this convoluted idea of like, oh yeah, you know, then we just trade suplexes on our heads. It doesn't matter. Right? <laughs> but it. But it's up. like. Did we discuss Fighting Spirit in the last one? I, I don't remember, but I like how you explain this. So, so this is really awesome. I, I believe it's not just a wrestling thing. It's a cultural thing in Japan called the Fighting Spirit. Where because they're such a, an overworked culture and they're just so there's so much pride in, okay, I need to do this amount of work, I need to do this, I need to never get tired, never get sick, never whatever, you know, almost Vince McMahon-ish. And then it's like once you get pushed to that brink and you're just like, I, I can't do it. I give up. The fighting spirit enters your body and it allows you to do, you know, to, to get through that. Superhuman feats. It's like in our culture, it's like, uh, the car just fell on the kid. Oh, a guy lifts the car up. Oh, my God. So it's that moment in a match where it, it's, it just has to be done carefully in a way that it's like, the perfect situation, you know, like some of those, some of the uh, the, the classic '90s uh, Japanese wrestlers just had that perfect moment of 
boom, fuck you, boom, ah, you know, so it's, it's the evolution of that has kind of changed over time. And you've but. ruined, this man right here has ruined the German suplex on the head, guy gets up, German suplex or girl, indie yeah. girls do it, I'm gonna German you, oh, oh I'm gonna get up and German you, oh. but now with him I'm conditioned, like the good way to do it is like the person takes it and they're like, ah, and they go like this yeah. and then they have the fighting yeah. spirit. There's that reason, there's that yeah. that, that gear change. Because like, there's, there's got to be a connection with the crowd. Yeah. And as you're doing it, you can hear. Yeah. So you can go, oh, way fuck, to do they're it. not buying this. Yeah. Or I need to do something more to get them to buy this and believe this. And and it's a gamble. You know, you never know what the crowd's going to do. And I've, I've had one kickouts that have been incredible. And I've had one kickouts that are like, hmm, probably shouldn't have done that. <laughs> what, what, what is the first time you remember... A, a finish of a match, but the guy kicks out at one. Backland like used that. to do that. Backland. Backland used no to do shit. that. Backland used to do but it was not that traumatic in the yeah. sense of, um, it, it wasn't as much as like when I first started seeing it in, in Japan. Mm -hmm. You know, and I don't even remember who the first one was in Japan to do it. Because you're so, you're so used to the pattern that when you break the pattern, you know, when you break the pattern, it's like, whoa. Well, I mean, one of the things that, that they did was, um, and I don't know if this was before or after, but they did uh, matches in Japan where they did the, the two count finish. So you mm, so you had to kick out right. one. Yeah. But it made like at first I thought like is that going to be because when you do like a near uh, what you would consider a great near fall in a three count match, in a two count match you're thinking like well this can end it because it's only a two count. Yeah. And so the near falls were actually like I thought it would be worse. They were actually better. Yeah. Hey, one count match. What? Last so year, about this, this this is the night after we taped last year. This man here <laughs> crafted a match with Jack Evans, who's awesome. And they had the one count match where Chris, everything he would do to Jack, Jack won. Oh, they got the one count <laughs> over. Like and, the fans and literally I, were like, the one count. You I, were over, I, Jack was over. I one did that because over. I wanted to have one really good false finish on a two count. <laughs> and then we just did the finish right after that. So oh, it, just, awesome. it just made that moment. And Jack is just so good. And it, he's so good at getting killed and then showing fight. And mm -hmm. he's showing fight and without being a, a stupid shit. punch to the ribs. It's like just, you know. He's so durable too. So like yeah. the fact he kept kicking out on one, I love that. Yeah. It's funny, yesterday, uh, wrestlers, it's like the Malenko Guerrero thing where everyone counters everything. Oh, like, oh, it's oh, a counter oh, business. Oh. It's a counter culture right now in wrestling where basically everyone is just counter happy with everything. Yeah. In your day and in my day and your day, oh, I'm going for the big suplex. Nope, I'm blocking that shit. Like yeah. the, the little, or go for a slam. No, I or this guy here. Or has, body <laughs> slam. Oh, back bump. Yeah. He's now, every time you see Chris Hero go for a pile driver, everybody can do a fucking pile driver. Chris makes it mean something because a guy will go to a knee, they'll fight. He's not just going to get the guy up, so the guy eventually, when he goes up, it's going to matter. So, like, I, I joked yesterday that the match I want to see, and it, it's not happened yet, but it's, it's in my dreams. I want a match where someone goes for a suplex, blocks it, goes for a whip to the buckle, reverses it. I want every blockage possible done, and then someone just wins with, like, a simple, you know, full body slam cover. Oh, they got a move and they won! Yeah. Like, to me, I just it's love a story. That. Yeah, yeah. It's, I just think that... Because, because honestly, the, in a psychological sense, counter, counter. Counter counter. It would have to be very sharply done. Sure. But the fatigue that it takes to keep countering and to keep countering yeah. and to keep. And then once you get the. Because the fans will be into it, then they won't be into it. Mm -hmm. And then slowly they'll start to go, oh, I think this is what's going on. And then they get in on it. And they're like, oh, oh, oh. And then when you finally pay it off, that, that's what wrestling is. Yeah. It's building to a payoff. You know what I think? It's been done before, but I don't think it's done enough, is that. Because, you know, like when, especially now that, that everyone's seen fights and yeah. like a guy will go in there, but then they'll get tired at the end. Yeah. The idea that, you know, you dominate for a long, long time mm -hmm. and then you have to do a long match to make this yeah. work, but you're the guy who was dominating just hits the wall and he gasses and it's like the baby face then starts making the comeback and the guy's just gassed and hanging on. Rope a dope. Yeah, like a right. rope a dope type yeah. of thing. Yeah. I'm going to take all your punches, but you're getting so tired hitting me. But It's yeah. the old Jake yeah. Nikita Koloff story oh, where Nikita wasn't selling shit for Jake, so then Jake called 10 body slams in a row. Nikita's just like, oh, he's like, I knew I going to sell, you know, and then he went for the first shot to the ribs. But, like, I love that, too, because, like, it's it's so it, – I like when it's different. I yeah. think yeah. – yeah. we've all watched that, 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 a, a and, ridiculous and that, amount of wrestling it, when the template has changed. But, it's so much more interesting You, you know what's me. so funny to me on that is is that, like – Fans get, I know fans who get mad, 
and I go like, the, the, when it's different, that's that's when it's the yeah. best. Because when they when they cross you up, it's like, oh, you know, like he he didn't sell this like everybody, like Ishii, right? Yeah. When, when, and they go, oh, Ishii doesn't sell well. Like, Ishii sells phenomenal, yeah. but he sells different, and that's why I like it. But yeah. but you don't want everyone, you know, you don't want everyone to be the same. Mm -hmm. You know, you want like you know up and it, down. It, you can't do different just to be different. Right. right. You have to have a reason in mind because you can't just. Uh, start writing a story and it's a great story. You have to have an end in mind. So how do we get there? And it's, you know, this and that. And you can, it, it's like a, you have to have like a six month plan or something. So, so for instance, um, like when I wanted to start winning with elbows, when I first started winning with elbows, people were like, what, what is this? Is this you know, it's anticlimactic, but it takes time. You have to put in that work to establish a new pattern and then it can be different. Like, uh, then like you could add a loaded yeah. elbow. Okay. Then... So for instance, you're talking about the pile drivers. Uh, I believe I did this. I don't know if I, I did it with Thatcher, I think maybe for the first time and then Tommy in, but it's like, go for a pile driver, block, block, block. I can't get him. I can't get him. I'm gonna use the gotch to get him in. I yeah. can hook his groin and flip him up, and I actually hit it, and I've actually won with that before. Mm -hmm. So it's not traditional now. It maybe was traditional back in the day, but it's like anytime there's a block, the fans go, oh, okay, there's gonna be a sequence, and there's gonna be another move. Yeah. But it's like, no, no, maybe, like, like th they do it a lot in Japan where it's like you suplex the guy, and you block it, and he blocks it, and he blocks it, and then he lifts him up like an inch off the ground, and then two, three, four, five, six. Oh, uh, the armor oh, thing, oh. yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it's just, it's because you you see it, okay, what's happening? Okay, I know what's happening. I know what's happening. Oh, 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 no, that didn't happen the way I wanted it to. And you have to do it a certain amount of times so that that becomes a new pattern. And then you can just switch all this it, stuff around. That's when it's more exciting when you don't know what's gonna happen every, or you have the right kind of anticipation. Everyone has seen everything under the sun. So it's funny, <laughs> I was sitting having some nice breakfast with Dan Barry today and Dan Barry did one of my favorite moves the last five years recently in a PWG match. He was on the top rope and you remember the old Jushin Liger, Frankensteiner on Brian Pillman. The, yeah. the top rope Brana was a hot move. Like Candido did it and Johnny B. Bad was doing it in America. And I was like, whoa, yeah. top rope Brana. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. With the guy sitting on the rope. Yeah. So it's like Dan Barry was on the rope and he went like this. Uh, uh, and just him faltering like that. Ooh. When he finally hit it, everyone just went nuts. And yeah. I'm like, that's the hottest move on the show because it was the idea of, oh, God, we really want him to hit this. And then he hit it. And I go, that was brilliant. He goes, no, I was kind of, that was totally, yeah. I almost slipped. I go, oh, I go well, God damn it, that's a wonderful thing. Just, uh, just keep trying it. Uh, somebody told me a story last year in Japan. I forget exactly who it was, but there was an old FMW show, and there was a tag match, and it was Sabu and Hayabusa. Mm -hmm. And Sabu was, you know, had a bunch of injuries, so he was, you know, gone. I don't know if it was, you know, like a muscle relaxer kind of thing, but he was just, but he went out to have the match, and, you know, he could, pull off extraordinary things. However, he had Hayabusa up for the top rope Frankensteiner, and he had him, and he just kind of And like, Hayabusa is, you know, he's, he's the young guy compared to Sabu, and he holds Sabu with reverence. So he's not gonna just do something because it's like, well, he's not doing, I gotta do something. So, for two minutes, <laughs> Would you stop? <laughs> Two minutes. He just stood there and stood there until it got awkward and other people were just kind of look and whatever. And the other two guys in the match started doing something, but he just stayed up two there. Two minutes. And then finally, oh, yeah, okay, let's do this. <laughs> and then wow. hit it. Sad That's not quite a, a Dave Barry falter, but two minutes. That's equivalent. <laughs> Dave, first time you saw Sabu, I remember the first time. We'll go around. First time we all saw Sabu, we'll start with you. Man, that's tough. Because I, I saw Sabu in the Memphis Territory yep. when him and Rob Van Dam came in, but I don't remember much about Rob's it. Rob Um Yeah, Rob Zikowski. Um It was, it was, I mean, it was definitely... Oh, Good God. Heart Show? No, did you ever go to any of those lines? No, no, no. I, I think I first saw Sabu in um, FMW. Okay. When he was with, with I, I, I don't think he was with Sheik, but it might have been with Sheik. Mm -hmm. The first time I saw him live was definitely FMW with Sheik, mm -hmm. where he did like all the moves and Sheik was just like over like crazy. Yeah. But um, yeah, so that would have been that was the first I saw him. Where the first I heard of him as getting a push was in the FMW days. Yeah, so. mm -hmm. Pic pictures at After Max. Yeah, first time I saw him, I was just oh. He, but then that was kind of when I got out of wrestling. I got out of wrestling, ninety four, ninety five, ninety six, or like yeah, a little bit of ninety four, ninety five, ninety six. I wasn't really watching anything, and then late ninety seven, I got back in. So I'm so my reintroduction was nineteen ninety eight ECW. Yeah. But I, mean, I got I got to see the Heat Wave 98 match live yeah. from Harrowina. Yeah. 
Mine was kind of like, I just, I just got the Observer in 93, and it changed me. I was like, what is this? Like, the first one was like, I think the stabbing with Sid and Arse. Your wrestling like, puberty. Yeah, yeah, it just took me to the next level. I was like, what is Sid and Arse stabbing each other? And why does this guy know all this? So then there was that, and then like, you wrote about Sabu debuting in Philly, and you said he scared everyone and whipped chairs around the building with Taz. I'm like, what is going on in Philadelphia? I live near there. And, and then basically I got a tape of the TV and Paul had put this awesome clip together and it was just Sabu being nuts. And he did an, a top row of Orihara moonsault onto Len St. Clair, or was it Doc, Dr. Hannibal or Dr. Luther? Dr. Luther, I think it was. But he broke facial bones, just insane, crazy, wild, reckless moonsault, hitting him in the face with his knees, breaking a table. And I just saw this and I'm like, what is the, like I've seen Jushin Liger prior. I remember Jushin Liger doing like the forward flip dive to the floor of the outside moon song. That blew my mind enough. But then like, who is this guy and where'd he go? And then I was just obsessed. Like I was the guy that bought like every Sabu VHS like fifth generation copy possible at the time. So was that that was fan. I mean it was interesting how Paul I mean Sabu had already made a little bit of a name on the indie scene by by breaking tables mm -hmm. and and just doing all the spots that you know way more than. You know, again, it was breaking the norm of what people wanted. I remember, like, like wrestlers would like criticize him because it's like it's not wrestling what he does; it's a stunt show. It's not wrestling, but it, because it was different. I mean, it, it, yeah. it, you know, that was like one of the building blocks of ECW was Sabu. Mm -hmm. I remember, I remember thinking, because your magazine or your, your newsletter, I, I used to think. Sabu, Big Titan, Gladiator, and the Headhunters were like my guys. Cause like yeah. freaking Headhunters, the those head guys were hunter, great. Man. When oh. I saw them, the first, when I saw them, okay. so so that's like you know like I'm watching these guys do dives that are 400 pounds mm -hmm. that are like five foot eight or whatever they were, and it's just like you're not supposed to be able to do this stuff. Yeah, this is like ridiculous. There's stuff in between now. Looking back on it, kind of rough, but like Jesus, if you just put a highlight clip together yeah. of those guys. Well, here here's the thing. When you're seeing, this is why. Uh, when you talk about it, it's crazy high flying or crazy hardcore or something like that, you're watching it and something really impressive happens mm -hmm. and it takes you a while to process it. So as you're processing it, you're going, fuck, that was crazy. I can't believe it. So you're not paying attention to the in-between thing. Mm -hmm. It's a firework, another firework, another firework. Yeah. Now what happens is when you see this over and over and over and you know their routines, that's when the middle stuff becomes glaring and you go, God, he's got shitty punches. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I've seen the thing off the top. I've seen the thing to the floor. So it... It's okay to blow up like that, yeah. and to, but then you have to be conscious that, hey, this is getting you attention, but you need to keep their attention with the other stuff. Yeah. Because it's like, a, it, it's like a, a, a trailer for a movie. You watch the trailer and you go, oh, wow, that's crazy, that's awesome. I want to see that and that and that and that. But you go to see the movie and the stuff in between is shit. You're just like, ah, okay, whatever. Yeah. So the I think the 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 like if you watch an Osprey match for the first time or something like yeah. that, it's a just give him a little highlight show. Wow, he he does he does these things that nobody else does. But when it comes down to it, it's got to be you know the selling, the maneuver, the maneuvering between things and whatever, and that's just makes the difference from here to here. Yeah, I always thought a great angle would be '95. Mm -hmm. Like I had, this, this is a thought from '95, by the way. Sounds childish, <laughs> but because you know I was in high school then. But anyway, but uh, so I always thought a good idea when Sullivan brought Sullivan wanted to bring the Headhunters in. It never happened. But I always thought they had Hogan there. Hogan was doing his Hogan things. Hogan liked wrestling big guys. I always thought a great thing would be like if a big headhunter hit an elbow and then Hogan came back and slammed him and the ref went down and he vanquishes him with a leg drop and then this other big fat guy comes from under the ring and they squashes him and then the other headhunter beats him. Yeah. It's like the the oh, twin the headhunters except with Abby's instead and like or the or the or the Sting Barry Wyndham. This, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Barry as Wyndham. a kid I loved that. Halloween Havoc is yeah, a yeah, great yeah, 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 yeah. PWI uh, cover as well, or wrestler or whatever. It it's was. a shame not many photos exist of Barry Windham with his hair cut yeah. and the face paint and the tights. It's with like so Sandman at ringside dressed yeah. as Sting as like a little <laughs> surfer guy back in the, <laughs> the day. But yeah, uh, God, where do we go next? Hey, do you ever have a, a thing? Because this is actually one of the things that he brought up kind of mm -hmm. triggered this. Do you ever a thing where where you saw somebody? And he was actually like, when you look back, he was so good that you rejected it because it was like blowing your mind. Because I had that, the first time I saw All Japan Women, because All Japan Women got on television yeah. in San Francisco on, the Fuji Network was, for a while, we got Fuji Network on cable, yeah. which was amazing. Oh, and the All Japan Women were, were on Fuji Network. So I remember I would watch it and they were doing all of this stuff and it was just like, it was Jaguar and Coda. Yep. And, and I'm just looking at it. process it, you're like, what? No, and I'm going like, 
no, this like they, they just rejected it like yeah. out of hand, it, and it's it's intimidating to because like I thought I knew wrestling, and then it's like they're doing you know these things, and yeah. it's like it's like so like I remember like a year later I went back and and um, and I think Terry Funk was like it was actually the catalyst of that where he just goes. You got to watch the All Japan Women, and I go and I watched them once. Terry Funk, I know. <laughs> supporter of Japan. Nineteen eighty four. Nineteen eighty four. Nineteen eighty four. He just goes. You got to watch the All Japan Women. They're better than the guys. Now, so, so when he says they're better than the guys, they're better than the guys. All of a sudden, it's like, well, if Terry Funk says they're better than the guys, I guess better I can watch them. Yeah. yeah, better than yeah. guys. Because yeah. before I'm watching them, go. They're better than the guys. No, I can't watch this. <laughs> it ruins everything it ruins I everything. thought about yeah. wrestling. Yeah. I, I think <laughs> maybe uh, a modern. A, a current day kind of equivalent uh, is similar is uh, maybe the matches between Okada and Tanahashi because everybody's championing them and uh, these great matches these five star matches but it's such an investment they're 30 minutes yeah you have to know some of the backstory so I can see people being intimidated like ah it's like I'd rather watch the movie I don't want to read the book yeah and I think I think it's some of that stuff it's so good and so great that people just Ah, I don't have the attention span for that. Ah, whatever, whatever. I think that the the very famous like UWF New Japan feud, something like that too. I would read back with stuff Dave would write about mm-hmm. it. Or there was a guy John D. Williams who really had some good breakdowns in the torch mm-hmm. about the background behind like you know Takata and Maeda and yeah. uh, well, they they had that Fujiwara. weird story, yeah, yeah, and just I love that blend of like the New Japan guys, the old guard, and then these. Dickhead shooters that were, yeah. you know, but, taking and, the and I've, I've been played. reading the New Japan book. Uh, was it Lion's Pride or something? Lion's like Pride, that. yeah. And it's just I didn't know about it. I only heard little bits. But just the interesting thing is like all the UWF guys, except for Takata, all got their asses kicked. Yeah, all of them. So then that even that made when Takata win mean even more because mm-hmm. it's like okay, we're gonna protect this guy, but the rest are just fodder. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the one of the things, I and mean, there was so much heat. Yeah. And and it was, but it was like you know we won the war. It was it was, it was the same as Vince and WCW. Yeah. In in in, in that and, and and to an extent Dusty with uh, the UWF. Oh yeah. It's like you know we we won the war and it's like you can blend all these guys in, but you know with them yeah it was like Takata's money. Yeah. So he's gonna do yeah. it, but the rest of these guys we're gonna prove that we were better. Yeah. You know yeah. and 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 they were smaller, mm-hmm. but I mean like I mean it's funny when you watch back. Um, if you watch back those clips and you like see like Sakuraba, yeah. it's like essentially a job guy and how big he got. And, yeah. you, and, and they had like Nagata was, that's when Nagata got his first, I wouldn't even say push, but he would be the guy who would be working with Sakuraba because he was such a good, you know, mm-hmm. amateur wrestler. And then like whatever it was 15 years later when Sakuraba became really big yeah. and then and came back to New Japan and then they would show those clips of them as kids practically. Yeah. And then you'd have Nagata and it, it, it revitalized yeah. Nagata again yeah. too. You mentioned the, the network where you got to watch the, the Japanese wrestling. I immediately, in my brain, when you said that, triggered FNN score. Because basically, the, when I found out that we were FNN score a few years later. you stop? See, I didn't even know that. I just know that Memphis came on that. I mean, my grandma's. Hawaii was on too. Yeah. Because I remember, was oh, that my Japan. Yeah. Yeah. I remember. Pro. That was a thing for me. Like, I lived in, you know, a little town in Pennsylvania. So we got, like, all the WWE. Or WWF, all the NWA, and then we got Power Pro Wrestling, which is a huge thing. We got NWF with uh, was that Rob Russin or yeah. I, I forget who that was, but like you know, like DC Mad Dog Drake Brody would come in, the Wild Simones often see it. But then when I saw FNN score, and it was like the Jerry Lawler show, and I'm like, what? This is this? I've been reading about it. So it was this huge thing. So I gotta ask to you the Atlanta Eight Hour Wrestling Blog, very famous from nineteen eighty six. Joe Pedersino did. Yeah. Did you have a satellite? Did you get to see any of that? You I got tapes. I'm sure. I got tapes. Yeah. I got the tapes. Because that when I was a little kid, I hated everyone from Atlanta because <laughs> basically they could see I was everything. so jealous that they could see all that stuff. And that's when wrestling was really big on television. You get mm-hmm. some indie station, yeah. and it was every Saturday night, and it was just a that was like a really cool thing. Yeah. yeah you know that FNN Score almost got New Japan. Well, the guy. The, there was a guy who worked there who was like a big. He was actually a roller derby wrestling guy, so so he he got the the the, 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 Hawaii, the Hawaii and the all Japan women, and they had English language all Japan women, um, which was you know, and this was like a little bit past the peak peak, but 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 I mean as far as the crush girls, but it was still the crush girls here. Yeah. But you know, so that was pretty amazing with Dumb Matsumoto and everything. But he was like trying to get New Japan, but they could never get the price to the to to something. But this is like in '85, you know, and I I always thought. You know, it's funny now, because I always thought, like, 
in the 80s that Japanese TV, when they were showing all those main events, when we mm. only got squash matches on TV, I was like, mm. if this TV ever got here, this would just be so awesome. Yeah. But we were always having to run to the video store yeah. and things like that to get it. So never happened. Uh, as a kid, uh, we had a, a satellite dish, a giant satellite dish. Uh, so uh, we would get the Onsat magazine. I, I think maybe it would have like maybe a month of programming in it, or like, I don't think it was weekly. But in the back, you would go to sports, and there would be pro wrestling, and then like, oh, I can watch world class here. I can watch I or ICW here. I can do. So I did get to see a little bit of that stuff in like ninety, ninety one, ninety two. 92. But it was always on at weird times at weird channels. I think we all have an appreciation. I don't want to be like, oh, it's those damn kids these days. But like, <laughs> man. And we didn't get to see much and then yeah. when we got it we valued it so much yeah, it's like it was like wow what a treat and, and now everything's just so accessible it's on so YouTube. easy everyone sees it's everything so, yeah, okay, like, oh, so you impress me and it, it's when, just so much when, harder when now somebody so have an appreciation online complains about a stream quality oh yeah <laughs> it's fuck like, you. Well, like like 18th yeah. generation d d d yeah. Yeah, videotape yeah I'm begging you to watch my 18th generation of Loki and Rick fucking Blade oh I wish they had the stream in HD I'm like Come on! Oh, yeah. well, you know, like when 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 I grew when I grew up, I mean, we 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 had like on the TV, we would have like the rabbit ear stuff. So like, the cornet would probably do this better than me, but we did have he because he would like live in Louisville, right? Yeah. So he would like fix up the rabbit ear so we could get like Indianapolis, but you barely got it. Yeah. But you just asphyxiated with it, and like I we, yeah. we had that like with um some of the stuff every now and then we yeah. get a station from. Kind of far away, mm -hmm. you know. Kind of like as a, as a kid growing up, like listen. Did you ever listen to like the out of town like like uh, sports games or anything like yeah, that on the, yeah, on the radio? And like you, late you, at night, you'd have to. Uh, you, you, there'd be like a. Yeah. And you'd have to just like teach yourself to ignore it and then listen to what you were listening to. Yeah, because because I would like listen to Vin Scully do you know yeah. Major League Baseball off of the LA station, but yeah. but I couldn't do it during the day because it wouldn't yeah. carry. Yeah. But but at night I could hear it really great. Mm -hmm. yeah. I I used to watch wrestling that was maybe partially scrambled because it's like, because when you're on satellite, there's all kinds of stuff and you don't always have the package for all of it. So it's like, oh, okay, I'll watch an hour of this that, that there's no, it's muted, yeah. you know? Or like, I'll watch it where it's like. <laughs> <laughs> like, I would, uh, we didn't have TBS in Shemokin, Pennsylvania, big surprise there. So like, I would feign illness to go to a nearby 30 minute away hospital to carry the station. Oh my God. So like, I'm begging someone to like, you know, oh man, my kidney's bruised. I gotta watch that progress show. Like, no one's gonna fucking do that these days. But like, at the time, I was so desperate to see The Clash that I would just be like, you know, I don't feel so good, Mom. And then we'd get to go to Ashland and I'd be in the waiting room. Like, oh, do they have TBS? And then I basically, you know, get to watch. I literally remember watching the Georgia Brawl in 91 where uh, Gigante knocked out Kevin Nash and One Man Gang to win. And I was so happy to so 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 so, the, <laughs> the, the, so so when 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 um, Bob Backlund was defending the title against Don Morocco, because we grew up with Don Morocco in San Francisco yeah. and he was getting a title shot. So MSG cable, we didn't get MSG cable, but there were places, and we were trying to find out like, guys, is there any place like within an hour or two hours that got <laughs> MSG cable? We can at least just, like check into a hotel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we would like call hotels up and just we never did by the way. Yeah. But it was like, you know, do you get MSG cable? And it's like, no, no, we don't get MSG cable. And I was like, oh, God, doesn't anyone get MSG yeah. cable? Because it, you know, because it would be on live. Yeah, it's the yeah. thrill of the hunt. You know, you wanted to see this shit. You're gonna yeah. find a way, one way yeah. or the other. Whereas now, like again, it's just. But so, it's so. But it's great. It's though. awesome. It's I know. It's, it's, I, I'm, it's, I'm an it's, asshole it's, for saying, oh, how dare you? But like, no, no, it's, now, the, it's the I'm greatest thing in the world. Accessible now. Yeah, yeah. but it, it allows. Like 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 we were talking before. You can you make your your career of as far as making oh. a star is so much shorter because. All you have to do is get kind of a buzz, and yeah. then people will know who you are. It's not like, oh, 15 people know who you are. Yeah. You know what I mean? They, they all trade tapes, yeah. and nobody, yeah. else, nobody yeah. else outside of like your little hometown yeah. knows you. It's like, you know, you're like Will Osprey, right? Yeah. It's like, it's not like just a few people in England yeah. know him and oh, a few people, you know, like, yeah. oh, who's this guy? It's like you can just click this thing, and it's like, there he is. Yeah, and I, and I also think, uh, I think, Rob, you and I are very similar in this. Uh, like for instance, when a new guy would debut, oh yeah, uh, rather than like, oh, new guy debuts now, and oh, let's watch him in PWG, oh, let's watch his evolve match, oh, let's watch him in progress. It's like we would watch the same match over and over yeah. and over. Yeah, and, and it's just based as long as long as it was a good match, it would hold up, and yeah. you'd be like, oh wow, and you would just build up anticipation for the next thing. Whereas now it's just, 
I don't want to say oversaturated, but it's just different. It's yeah. different in, in the way that you have to go about putting your matches together, uh, the different opponents you have, booking of the matches, mm -hmm. and yeah. Here's an interesting one. Well, I mean, that's, 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 that's one thing where, where people used to complain about Flair. Yeah. In the sense of, you know, he did the same match here, you know, if yeah. you, when you watch back on that stuff. But it was like, in those days, he was doing house show matches. Yeah. And, and if he, he wasn't... He, he, Ric Flair wasn't having that match so that 30 years later somebody would watch it on YouTube and go, oh, it's the same match as this one. <laughs> no, he did the match for the fucking live crowd yeah, there yeah. and to get the person over. That's one thing. Not This isn't going to be a rant, but when I see a lot of reviews online, which I'm, I'm not critical of reviews because people can have their opinion, mm -hmm. but I think a lot of people watch wrestling on the internet and write about it, but they don't take into account the live reaction. So, for instance, it's like... Sometimes it doesn't come across as well on film, but you can see that the crowd's enjoying it. As mm -hmm. long as the crowd's enjoying it and it's loud and the right spot. Yeah, Some people are, they, it's like tunnel vision where they're not even listening to the crowd. Mm -hmm. um, and o then, over reliance and, on yeah, execution. And then it's the other yeah. way around too, where you have a match that's going to be sent all over the world that people are going to love, but you don't have the people, people right in front of it, you. Yeah. So. Anyway. Well, I mean, one of the things like when people will talk to me and, and, and they'll go like, they'll, they'll, they'll watch a match from like, they'll go like, do you ever like want to like redo stars of a match from thirty years ago? And it's like, no, it's, um, it's thirty years later. How how would I know what, yeah. what I was thinking then? It's like it's and and, and or, or like someone will go like, oh, you know, this match that you said was this like back then. It's like if you didn't know the storyline to build to what you know. Again, in those days especially because the way they worked the match yeah. was based on the feud. Yeah, you know, it's a, if it's a grudge match, if it's a uh, two right. guys who liked each other, if it's whatever, and it's like. You know, the match had to fit the, yeah. the overall story. When, the second anybody complains about ratings or whatever doesn't get the concept of ratings. Because mm -hmm. it's like, it's a personal opinion. Yeah, and that's true too. It's a fucking personal opinion. Yeah. And like, you you try to find people that review things that whose likes and, and interests are in tune with yours. It's not always going to be right, but more often than, okay, like for, okay, Dave, I... I we like some of the same stuff, so I'm going to hold what you say in higher regard. But there are going to be some one-star matches that I think, dude, they were a lot better than you <laughs> yeah, credit yeah. for. And there's going to be ones I think are awesome that you're not going to... And people just... Yeah. I don't understand why we as a culture obsess on that. It's yeah. with movie ratings, with it, with all this different stuff. It's like, it's opinion. It's music, you know? Yeah. Who, who cares? And it, it's just, as long as more people enjoy it than don't enjoy it, you're good. What's the longest? Like, you, you bought a tape, a VHS tape, okay? Dave, this will be a really tough one for you, but I want to just ask the panel. Show happens. They kind of throw, here's the 800 number, here's the address to get the show. Yeah. APW, 2001 King of the Indies is mine. Because basically, Roland put on the show, and it was like Key and AJ Styles and Danielson and yeah, the I whole crew, going. Spanky. It was just a who's who of everybody. Brian Alvarez was on the show in the Brian, battle royal. Samoa Joe. And Samoa all. Joe. And I you, remember you, that you, show King happened. of the Indies, I zoned out for a second, right? Yeah. PW King of the Indies. King of the Indies, 2001, the show that pretty much birthed Ring of Honor. But right. basically, that show happened in 2001. It took seven. It was $50, by the way. I think wow, 50 really? for tape, even. Like, yeah. Roland fleeced all of us but regardless <laughs> god bless him but like what happened was we get these we waited eight eight nine months for this tape wow and when i got it i yeah. still was like yeah oh my god yeah. value this is well worth the wait anticipations my friend what was the show that you got that you could not freaking wait to show up at your door or any kind of tape tv i mean obviously there's probably numerous examples was there one in particular offhand that you could think of in the wow. 80s or 90s Chris, I could pose the same thing. Okay, so while Dave thinks, I have one that comes to mind, and I was just we discussed it earlier today, and I was talking about it uh, to Christopher Daniels yesterday. It was that 1999 Super 8, and the only reason it was so coveted for me is there were WWF guys in it, so WWF told ECW, hey, you can't release this. So it's like there's the Super 8 in 97, there's the 98, there's the 99 one, there's the 2000 one, and it's like no one had a copy of this tape. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, it happened, it was filmed, like, but they weren't allowed to release it. So when I got a bootleg of that and I could watch Matt and Jeff Hardy and Steve Bradley and Christopher Daniels mm -hmm. about this, you know, two years... You know, I already have you know a couple hundred wrestling tapes. I just had never seen this footage. So when I got to see that, it was it was a really cool experience yeah. to see that for the first time. Yeah. I mean, I can't come up with yeah, I can't come up with anything like no. that that fits that, that fits that one. I mean, you know, I mean, I was I would anticipate, but it usually would be you know a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't like it was months and months. Yeah. 
Now we're in Los Angeles. Were you at the famed show that never was taped? You wrote about it. You list the 18 different crazy spots. The Star of Death. You know the match. We all know the Star it. Star of Death. That was an incredible I, match. Uh, you, what you saw it. I saw it. I hate you, Dave Meltzer. I I, I want to see that match so bad. It, A lot it of people did deep. after my review. Sure. It was it was it was. I mean, like by today's standards, as if I think about it, mm -hmm. I think that it would be. It's more normal today. Um, because it was just like it, it was just a collection of crazy spots. spots. Yeah, and you know, so so, but back then you didn't see. And, and again, these were like you know, you had younger guys moving to psychosis moving to, yeah, to give that you were some really, names. Ray Mysterio Jr. Uh, probably Damian Six Six. And this was in L.A. It was Los L.A. Sports Angeles. Arena. Yeah. yeah, it was like a big like. It was, it, was, it was like a cage match. Yeah. It was it was like a it was like it, was, it might have been a ten man. Yeah. Yeah. But um, I want Lucha Underground to redo it. <laughs> like that's what I the code ain't even there anymore. I want no, some promotion not. to redo that and just have all the fucking young, hot, like flying but, but, guys but, but, and just but, let them bust it out. But in a crazy, I, I, I nonsensical match. I'm sorry. That's okay, what I so what, what I can what I can say is is like I've seen when when, when, the, when those kind of matches in Lucha Underground they really are better than that match. Yeah, that, they're that a blast. I, I love that, it. That, you know, like those kind of matches now. I mean, in the sense that. You know, because sometimes I see them and it's like, wow, you know, it's like they're just doing everything under the sun. Yeah. But they went for they they go further now. Some of the stuff that those guys do when they're doing the balcony dives and stuff. I mean, that uh, that was control. that yeah. was crazy. Uh, I had gotten into wrestling and I finally got some footage of some battle cat matches. Oh, there you go. Because I had only seen photographs of yeah. battle cat. I was highly disappointed. Yeah. <laughs> was it now? Was it super bad, Bradley, or it was, was it Brady, Brady Boone? Boone? Brady Boone, yeah. Brady, Brady Boone was a good little worker. Yeah. Brady Boone did the only time ever I saw him stand on the top rope, much like our friend Sabu yeah. and uh, yeah. and Hayabusa. But like Brady Boone is like my height, so like he could stand on the top rope and give DDP yeah. a Rana, just like standing on the top rope dropping into a Rana. It was like the weirdest yeah. thing I ever saw. Because DDP yeah. was on the mat, like yeah. he wasn't even sitting on. Had a, the had top a rope. long conversation with Rick Knox just about about Bobby Bradley. Bobby yeah. Bradley. Now, were there oh, two the, Bobby Bradleys? There was RBD's the, the, the Bob Bradley from New York and the Bobby Bob Bradley, Bradley from here. Oh, wait, which one? Yeah, see, he, it's probably the Vegas Bobby Bradley. The Bobby Bradley, if he's talking about the guy, it'd be the Bobby oh, Bradley So, the here. Bobby Bradley from here was not Battle Cat. No, that was no, Bob Bradley. No, no, that's Bobby Bradley from East Coast. Yeah. Okay, because, but Brady, where's Brady Boone from? It's another, Min it's another conversation. Brady, it's not Brady, being had by anyone else on earth, but you just Brady, got Brady, in your Brady, life, guys. Brady Boone was like from the same high school as like Zink and um, Kurt oh, and, and all those guys in, okay. in Robinson High, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Because there is a Brady, there is a Battle Cat Bob Bradley match where he's Battle Cat against Bob, Bob Bradley. Bradley. Damn. But I don't know which Bob Bradley it is. So that would be, no, that would not be the Bob Bradley from here. Okay. Most likely. Uh, I, don't, okay. I don't remember if he ever did. The one that was in WWF was, was the Bob Bradley from the East. Okay. Here's an interesting one. A little birdie told me recently that all the house shows from the 90s WWF that they had, gone. Really? Gone. Like, it doesn't exist. You mean, you mean, you mean like that? that a saying? lot of the old footage, a lot of the old darks. Like, I, when I was at WWF. Maybe, maybe that's why they, nobody can find that um, Bret Hart McGee. I'm match. almost positive. Because here, wow. here's the deal. Someone told, I didn't know, because I asked recently if the Jacques Rougeau. Uh, Pierre Carl Lett match where they drew the big house in Montreal in 1994, drew bigger than Hogan and Flair. Uh, so I was like, I want to see that match because it built and it was a good story and I felt the match paid off. I've never seen, I saw clips, but that's it. So I asked someone in higher places and like, yeah, they don't exist. I'm like, what? So then I thought like, when Max Moon debuted as Conan, like you had like Luis Piccoli, you had uh, Art Bar came in. You had a host of guys that could work lucha matches with. Uh, Which Bobby Bradley is that? With Conan, I love that we've got footage um, right there. That's super bad Bob Bradley and, and Brady Boone, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. So he is the one that played the other Battle Cat. This is Battle Cat versus Battle Cat. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, 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 yeah. It's absurd. Uh, so yeah, it's it's one of those things where all these matches that I would have wanted to see, I don't think, I'm pretty sure, because now the people in charge, they destroy, it's like the old Ole Anderson theory, they destroy nothing now. Everything's kept. So like, yeah, rightfully. So like, they'll have it as bonus stuff. Can you, Im and can you imagine? But again, it's like, it's like in, in 1975 when you're a promoter, yeah. do you realize this thing's going to be worth so much yeah. money? But, but I mean... They, because the era before them, almost nothing was recorded. Yeah. So it, it to not have footage of something wasn't a big deal because they didn't always have footage of anything anyway. It would be yeah. one thing if there was 
everybody had a lot of footage, then it was gone, yeah. then it was there was footage again. It was like, no, they went from literally having no footage of these record these matches. Yeah. And it was only imagine how good those matches were yeah. that were never recorded. You know, it's and, like, oh man, best match of my life. You should have seen it. It was And just you know, to whatever. backtrack before this gets correct, because I know how people are, but like this isn't like the MSG shows or like the Prism shows for yeah. Philadelphia area. This is like the random house shows they haven't have a camera at that they yeah. did tape things and it would leak or they'd have it regardless. Yeah. Those like well, obviously the, the, they kept the, the, the house that, shows. Okay, but, but like, the match that I talked about was a dark match. Yeah, which you would have had yeah. due to sort. Yeah, yeah. so that's, yeah. that's intriguing to me. Yeah. Uh, let me look at the other questions. Um, what do you know of anybody before Road Warrior Hawk to no sell the pile driver? To pop mm-hmm. up out of it. No, so that was the that first was a, one. The, the road words were the first ones in, in like 83, 84. Yeah. yeah, when you first saw it, were you like, yeah, that's awesome? Or like, mm. oh no, I was mad. Oh, you were mad? I was mad because, you know, Pile Driver was like, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. The Pile Driver was like Here the killer you. of all killer yeah. moves. And this guy's like, it, like Hogan was popping up from a lot of stuff, but he yeah. never did a Pile Driver. Yeah. Now, he may have done, done that with Orndorff. Sure. But, but that would have been a couple of years later. Yeah. So, yeah, the first time I saw it. But like, Hogan would have at least kicked out of a pin. Yeah. Road Warrior Hawks like nah man I got these giant muscles here and it prevents my head from but 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 after but after a yeah. while yeah I actually accepted it more in time yeah at the first time I saw it it was just like oh man <laughs> you know it's like what are you doing ruining this great move yeah yeah um, and I thought it was like the beginning of the end of civilization in fact at yeah first, <laughs> at first you the know, business is going to hell That's yeah uh, and I just think that it's like like I was saying earlier you can. Oh, there's a difference between no sell and just selling in a different way. Right. I mean, every oh, he just no sold this. He but no sold Rick, that or Rick, whatever. Rick but Flair loved doing that yeah, spot, and Rick yeah. Flair wasn't even a pile driver. Yeah. Guy, but he would always do it with those yeah. guys because they would get up and they would always be a giant pop. Yeah. I mean, I mean even from from the from day one when yeah. he did it, like when they well the, the first time I think I saw him do it might have been with Waller in um, in Memphis, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and and you know and, and again that was like not not only. Was, that was like a band move in Tennessee. Yeah, you know, yeah. they, they really made it big. And so he pops up. And that was like, I remember in the crowd, it was like, oh my God. I mean, he got the Road Warriors yeah. over so yeah. big. How do you think Animal felt? Like, oh, you fucking dick. Like, you, you're the cool one now. No, like, but Animal started doing it too. Oh, Animal, Animal did it too. <laughs> right, me too. Animal, me too, bro. Animal, <laughs> Animal started doing it too. It, it wasn't just Hawk. Hawk was the first one. Yeah. But then, then they started yeah. doing it with Animal too. Yeah. yeah. Because then, it, well, it, it's, there just has to be a reason why it doesn't hurt you. What, what happened? Well, like, it's a giant trap. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. But, you know, like, for instance, I like when somebody gets hit with one of their own moves and is like, hell no. Nah. You, know, you can't well, hit me with my own well, shit, you know? You know, that, that power bomb with the, the, with the Liger last Yeah, yeah. I hit him with a Liger bomb. He's yeah. Like, no. no. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's a fucking Liger bomb. That's my thing. Yeah. Even if you're just like, just going through the motions, there's a thing inside you that has been so violated that you just have this utter defiance. Like, yeah. no, I refuse. You know what I think is so different now from before? Yeah. is like now, if you do like like uh, somebody's trademark move, yeah. the fans like boo you for stealing the move, yeah. which never would have happened like, yeah. even like six, yeah. seven years ago. Yeah. You know, so yeah. What, what is the first time that you remember seeing in with an impactful situation where somebody stole someone's move to beat beat them with their own move. That that kind of thing. Do you, is there any kind of a well, I mean, there's, there's, there's the Shawn Michaels Bret Hart, but I'm, mm-hmm. I'm sure it was before that. Yeah. The, I mean, the one that I remember when you bring it up now is when they brought in Terrace Bulba to Texas and he beat Kerry on <laughs> with, with, with a claw. claw. He beat him clean. I, I, I couldn't believe it. Because number one, the guy had been a job. Clean, yeah. He was, there was, been a job guy and Kerry Von Erich yeah. was never, you know, they wanted to get a guy over really yeah. big immediately. And, and then let, just as a little sidebar, the Von Erich claw, Baron Von Raschke claw. There's a difference. There's a he difference would hold the, the tail. Because I think when Fritz would do it, I mean, guys would juice, so you'd see a head full of blood. But when Baron did it, there would be no blood. So I think, am I right but, there? But but Baron, oh. okay, Baron, yeah. but Baron got the, the idea of the claw from Baron was uh-huh. because Pat O'Connor said Fritz Von Erich was great with the claw, and your name is Baron Von Raschke, and that's yeah. how he got the claw. Yeah, and he had big hands. Yeah, you know that which always helps the claw. Yeah. Yeah. Those damn his A M A W A Remco figure has a hand that's yeah, like this. Big, so they had to create a separate mold for Baron Von Raschke's hand on damn one hand. action figure. The whole set. Shit. 
Yeah. They didn't create a, a new body for Abdulix because Abdulix is yeah, yeah. <laughs> But they needed to create a, a Baird von Raschke hand. They just gave Blackwell the the black thing to put over the body <laughs> yeah. suit. He was felt. Yeah. He looked, he's the same size as Gordy's doll. Uh, so uh, here's one. Rewatched a random ass match the other day. Yokozuna, you were at it live, by the way, I believe. Yokozuna, Hulk Hogan, oh, the title change with Whippleman. First, yes, but here's the thing. Brilliant match. I don't remember how many stars you gave it. You give I, it an I extra one now, though. Check it. Okay. Here's the deal. This match, if we go back and watch it now, it is so brilliantly laid out because, especially if you know where it's going, where Yoko's yeah. going to be the new like top badass monster heel. Mm -hmm. It's the most Hogan's ever given anyone. Uh, the finish, of course, and here's what we're going to get into. He, the finish is obviously, for whatever reason, there's a million photographers for this match because the guy's Japanese, because it was allowed in those days. We're going to stereotype the shit out of this. We're going to put all these photographers at ringside, and one of these guys is going to get on the apron, yeah. camera explodes, Jimmy Hart chases him, he goes out, never to be seen again. Uh, the big man drops the leg, one, two, three, American hero's dead, Yokozuna is our new kingpin. So that all happens, right? Cool. Your, your newsletter, which I didn't get at the time, but it would have intrigued me at the time, Downtown Bruno was the bearded gentleman whose camera exploded. This was never mentioned again. Now, here's what I'm saying. My theory is, and this is really looking into it, but my theory is they eventually were going to put Bruno Lauer, or Downtown Bruno, in the role as the person to speak English for Yoko with Fuji, but mm -hmm. then Cornette was m a million times better, so Cornette slipped in, he became the guy, and I think they should have explained that Cornette was always the guy with the camera to begin with. That would have been good! And it would have tied, I'm a big guy good. about tying everything yeah. together, so that looking back good. on it, that's the first thing wow. I thought of, because I'm like, they never ever, that was a loose end, it was never tied, and to me, I think that would have been a brilliant way to do it. So uh, that uh, that's awesome. Yeah, that's right. Great. I have uh, looking back on one thing I hate in wrestling. I don't really hate many things in wrestling, but I hate poorly people not catching dives. He hates that. <laughs> <for sure>. <laughs> hate it. Yeah. It's just there's one thing if it's an accident. Accidents happen, but when you don't have a concern for catching someone. Yeah. Oh yeah. Or you, or you don't want to, maybe you don't know how to do it, then learn how to do learn it. How to or, do and then when, the you, when you call it in well, the back, don't fucking call it. Yeah. Well, didn't, don't. didn't, didn't Mike, Mike Graham, Jushin Liger, where Mike Graham. Oh, awful. Terrible. Yeah, Mike Graham's Mike, just like, yeah, I'm not going to catch it. I'm not going to do that. I'm not, I, I didn't grow so up. So dismissive and disrespectful. Yeah. 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 Uh, Hooventude, uh, with the Hooventude Liger match. Yeah. There was a dive that wasn't caught. Yeah. Right? That was an because, accident, but they all blamed uh, oh, the, It was okay. an accident, but but they started blaming everybody. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there was okay. some heat coming off of that yeah. one. I remember that. Um, I, a thing I dislike in wrestling are when things are poorly choreographed and it takes away the spontaneity of the... Like, for instance, somebody hops up on the apron, hey, referee, you da 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 It's going to lead to a finish or something. You can use that trope to play off of things, to false, get a false finish out of it. But when it is the finish, the guy's the music hits, he comes out, and whatever. So for instance, how many other matches in pro wrestling have you seen where a photographer hops on the apron to exactly take a fucking picture? Exactly It's You're just like, wait, this is fishy. Yeah. Why doesn't everybody else see this? And then Maybe that's why they forgot it ever happened. Yeah. It was never so, this is this and is I'm my sure solution. But the whole thing of, of of do some yeah you do something that's more natural. Yeah yeah yeah. yeah. So this is my solution to that. Uh, 20, 23 years later, <laughs> um, you do a thing where like Yoko is killing Hogan on the floor. The photographers are taking pictures, right? It's like oh wow they're taking pictures of him beating him up. You know Hogan does something. Hogan's posing. They're taking pictures, and then it was like a, a little flash paper thing out of the camera. Yep. Do it from the floor. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like whatever. Like hey, and then just aim it so that yeah. so that it doesn't look out of the order. And then you're just like, because as look, a fan, God damn it, we got to get the big shot on yeah, the apron. Yeah. Yeah. Boom. Yeah, and then I it happens, and then it's more surprising, and then yeah. it's le because it's like they have done it that way in the NWA. Yeah, I think, like correct. bullshit. They like might bullshit. Have, they might, have, they might be different set of eyes producing. Bullshit cheating that's yeah. like, hey ref, come over here, there's a thing over here. It's so fucking yeah, cheesy. It, it's oh, one of the things that embarrasses me when I watch wrestling. I'm like, oh god, I couldn't show this to a non-wrestling person because it's just, it's silly. It's like, why why are you doing that? Uh. So, so coming off of that, let's talk about Brett Thunderbird Como. Can I take a timeout? <laughs> and he's going to gonna uh, take a timeout. Take a timeout. <laughs>
On that note, guys, hey, you got a drink. Uh, let's talk about Brett Thunderbird Como. Uh, I remember uh, Como ties, uh, I would hear the, the line on the Japanese tapes. And he hit the shooting star of the floor, completely As the, psychotic. He was move. the ultimate dragon he against the, Ultimo Dragon. Yes. Right? Because Ultimo means final. Yes. Like final dragon. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it, Ultimo does not mean ultimate. Right. But I guess maybe ultimate, the original... I'd have to look at the dictionary. Maybe ultimate means the greatest or final. I don't know. It, it, I think anyway, I think it's the, the same ultimate deal. dragon. I will say this. Brett Como. Yes. Who called Ultimo? He was Ultimate Dragon in WCW because the people doing commentary and yeah. producers didn't yeah. know anything. Yeah. But Ultimate Dragon, Brett Como, he that was really good. There's what was, a Brett that, Como what was the tournament reason. that they were in where they wrestled each other? Was that War? I'm sure it was war. war. Yeah, war tournament, and then he did the shooting star press to the floor. Yeah, that's wild. Which the shooting star press was such a crazy move at that time. Anyway, but then to imagine doing it to the floor. And it was like '97, and like Kidman or Kid Flash would start doing it in '96 on Coral Luzo shows or '95 even. I remember being like, "Oh my god!" And Liger obviously always did it, but the amount of people that can do a shooting star, pretty freaking limited in the '90s. The first person to do it, Liger, obviously. The second person you saw do a shooting star, because I love doing stuff like this, I would say it was probably Kid Flash or Billy Kidman, Kidman. in 95. Billy Kidman. Because I think Durant. Sullivan saw it, and then he got a break with WCW. The seven-year itch. The seven-year itch. Yeah. But uh, back to uh, Brett Como to keep things going here. Uh, thoughts on him? Thoughts on why his career never really took off? Didn't you know, he, get, did he get hurt or something? Uh, you know, I'm sure he freaking did. I mean, I, he was kind of... But I don't really remember... Like, I remember him, and, he, and it was like... One of those guys, but Lenny St. Clair was another one. You, got you know, it. where I would watch them and I'd go like, oh, these guys are going to be great. And mm-hmm. then it didn't happen. Yeah. Right. Okay, so I may be wrong. I'm not 100% certain on this, but what I was told at the time and haven't gone back to find out if it's true or not, um, he eventually was brought into Torimon as the original Darkness Dragon. That, that may be possible. right. That I may think be there's right. something because to that. Yeah, that- the, a very pivotal match for me was the first time I saw James Mason on a Michinoku Pro show, mm-hmm. which led me to Japanese or British wrestling, mm-hmm. to Johnny Saint, or whatever. But Thunderbird Brett Como was in that match. And there were some matches he did for Michinoku where he had like the Darkness Dragon kick pads and, and whatever. And I, I, at the time, I believed before, uh, before the guy took over Darkness Dragon, I believe he was the original. Wow, so James Mason got you really into the European. Yeah, game. well, I actually I saw Saint first, and then I saw James Mason, but it was a conversation because um, it's just I was uh, with with good old Shirley Doe, if you remember from, I remember the, the, name, from, yeah. the, yeah. from the old uh, Death Valley Driver days at Pittsburgh Independent Wrestler. He had he had the tapes, he had all mm-hmm. the Japanese tapes, and he was like, "Yeah, I just got this new block of Michinoku," and he's like, "There's this guy, he looks like a, an old man doing." these incredible things but he's young yeah. he's like and then he's like oh they were talking about it. he's like oh if you think he's crazy watch this and then he put in Hoshikawa and Johnny Saint. that was the first match that I was like oh well, yeah, that's very different yeah. that is way that is completely because I knew Regal and Finley were different mm-hmm. uh, I didn't always know why I knew they did different holds yeah. and different moves but Johnny Saint's style was completely different and then I'm just like okay I need to get tapes for this guy and I was like oh that's what, that's, what Bill, that's, what, that's what Billy Robinson was when he first yeah. came over. Mm-hmm. You know, Billy Robinson and Johnny Eagles came over yeah. in like the early 70s. Yeah. And Billy Robinson was just so different, mm-hmm. um, but so impressive. You know, I mean, and, and also I think, I think with him, you know, it was weird because like there was no television term of a shooter. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, there was a term in the business. Yeah. You know, how would you explain what a shooter is on television? Yeah. Everyone should be a shooter, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, I mean, I always used to, I always used to, <laughs> it always used to get me mad in the Nitro days when they would put over like, you know, like Ming as a shooter and everything. Pit, Craig Pitbull, fucking Pittman. Yeah, and it's like, it's like, well, it, well it's Sergeant like, Craig Pittman. Yes. Yeah. But it's like, it's like, okay, if he's a shooter, why does he lose to these people then? You know what I mean? It didn't make sense to me, but, 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 but like with Billy Robinson, I didn't know, know it. They never used the term, but I could. But when you watched it, you always thought like him, J- Billy Robinson, Jack Briscoe was almost. There was, I don't even know what it was about him, because I didn't know Jack Briscoe's credentials. Yeah. But you would just watch him and just go, "They must be real." It, it's a, it's a combination of the types of holds they used and the different way that, and then the things they had to work out of the holds, and they would because some guys would just put on a chin lock and you know work out of the chin lock or whatever. But they, I mean. The, the the British world of sports style is 
hey man, we're gonna go out there for 30 minutes and we're gonna work a couple different holds. And then they would have a hold, but then they would each know 10 different sequences out of that hold. So I think that's like a checkmate Tony Charles. That's what Tony I was Charles. literally gonna bring him up. I saw Tony him. Tony Charles was, was one of those guys. He was the first one I ever saw because yeah. we got, for some reason in my it's a, domain. Let, let's, let's Thornton Tony Charles yes. matches in, in Florida that I saw were like, they were like incredible. Mm-hmm. Like second match, 20 minute draws. And yeah. they would just be like incredible matches. Yeah. But it was different from everything else. Bill and it was Dundee also and Charles and Memphis. probably the same type of thing. Yeah. yeah, it was also action without a whole lot of bumps. Yeah, which is it's difficult to actually create that action and that anticipation yeah. without bump, 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 bump. And I mean, they would work out of the hold, hit the ropes, boom, go for another thing, block it, go into another hold. It's funny, you, your first European stuff that you saw was from yeah. Japan. Mine was from yeah. world class in Texas. Like I remember checkmate Tony Charles. They would air the 1982 world class episodes in '86 for some reason. Yeah. So I have to oh, on ESPN, watch it. Yeah. yeah, ESPN afternoon shows. So I shows, watch yeah. it, and you know Armand Hussein and Fishman and all these people be on there. Fish Great Man. Kabuki and the Magic Dragon. But then like Checkmate Tony Charles was on. He just rolled with a ball. And as a little kid, it stays yeah. with me to this day. Yeah. Wow, that's really clever. When my sister tries to kick my ass, that's what I do also. Like that's a smart, real thing that you would do. So I thought I always thought he was awesome, and then. Obviously, you know, I see Doug Williams later and obviously yeah. Les Thornton and everybody else. One thing I want to uh, put on tape that a, a lot of people don't realize about the Johnny St. Ball spot. Uh, sometimes you call it the Blackpool Ball. Some people call it Lady of the Lake. The, the trick to it is that you're in a ball so that if you're on one shoulder, the other one's up. And they put you to the other shoulder and the other one's up. So that's why you just don't go, oh, let me just pin this guy. You know, and then it's also the the British style of once a guy's on the mat and you've broken contact, you're not supposed to be able to get him. You're not, you know, it's, you you might get a a public warning or, or, you know, get disqualified for attacking a guy on the floor. So that's a bit, I mean, they play around with it a little bit more, but it's just kind of like, well, what can I do with it? I can't grab his foot. I can't grab, you know, like, so you roll him around in a ball yeah. and it, you do it from a sunset flip or from a leapfrog or, or whatever. But it's, the idea is that, well, why wouldn't you just pin the guy? Well, you can't because you, you know, you roll him and he yeah. just goes back and forth. So One thing that, the defense he, technique yeah, also, you can't get yeah. an offensive there you go. Man, That's a really good deal. Uh, hmm. I'm going to ask another question here. One um, Dave, what did you think of the Young Bucks tights yesterday? Hmm. I mean, well, I thought more of them like a week ago when they did it in Japan for the first time. Yeah. So, okay, so, so, um, I mean, this was more like, uh, that's a lot of pictures of you. I don't it's even know. So many. Where, where the hell did they get all those things? Do you have like an Instagram that we don't know about, Dave? I don't even, I don't even have any pictures of myself anywhere. So it's like, I'm, when I saw that, it's like, where the, did you, by the way, do you guys know that there's a picture of Jim Cornette on, the, on one of those? Oh, yeah, it's the Cornette face, right? There's a Cornette face in the, like the, the <laughs> yeah. of Dave Meltzer's. There's yeah. one Jim Cornette in, on those tights. Because uh, I saw that when, when they did it in Japan. Because they, they debuted yeah. him in Japan last week. Mm-hmm. So so I woke up that... I was going to watch that one live, but but we ended up... Me and Brian ended up doing like a, a radio show. And then when yeah. it was over, it was like, I'm going to bed. I'm going to watch the Jacob in the morning. Yeah. And I wake up and I have all of these freaking emails. <laughs> You gotta see, you gotta see the young bucks. You gotta see the young bucks. So I watched it, and it was just like it was like oh, it was. I thought it was just hilarious. Then I showed everyone in my family, and they're just cracking up. (laughs) They're just thinking it's the greatest thing in the world. It's and just imagine the Japanese wrestling fan that has no contact. I mean, like what? (laughs) Nothing. Yeah, that was that was my yeah. I I, yeah. Uh, When when are we gonna see the? The, the Dave Meltzer shirts with all your fa- with your face all over. Never. You're gonna you're gonna put them up on pro wrestling tees. Come on, Dave. <laughs> Do you imagine Come on, Dave. Meltzer had a pro wrestling tees shop. You clean up. Ah, really? I you mean, then clean, you don't even realize. You we should clean up. Should do it then. I, I know, think I you need no, to. I have no moral reason not to do it. There yeah, you go. yeah, I think you need to. Okay. There could be oh, a, we, is this real? You you do it if you think people will be interested. Yeah, in it? Why, not? why wouldn't I? <laughs> okay, awesome. The wrestling business, Chris. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It is. Uh. Venom Black is a favorite of mine. Uh, obviously, he was really banged up, and he never really made it to the place he probably should have in wrestling. But, like, late 90s, you talked to Paul Heyman at the time, I'm sure. 
How close was he to debuting in ECW? I don't remember. You don't remember. You know, I mean, I mean, I, I just don't remember exactly. Because he wrestled for some random company in 98 near where I live in Pennsylvania. In PCW. Redding. PCW with Blaine DeSantis. Blaine DeSantis. He wrestled, I think, Christopher Daniels. Yeah, and Mike Modest came out for yeah. a show, and then Venom Black was on the show too, and I missed it. I was really mad, but then I heard yeah. it wasn't very good. Yeah. Because, again, it's, it's sometimes certain chefs know what to do with the ingredients, and other people yeah. book... Uh, Venom Black with Mr. Ooh La La, and it just doesn't really work. You know? <laughs> it's like you gotta have the right people in with yeah. the, the right other people. But uh, here's one Nitron. Remember Daryl Carl and Nitron? Big Sky? Yeah. yeah. Another one. Not bad. Probably should, he's a big, big money making man now. I think he went to acting. Yeah, he's a big money making man. Yeah, he Nitron. certainly is. <laughs> okay, so, so. Tyler Maine. What's this? Ty Tyler Maine. That's a shoot name. Tyler Maine. That's just. That's just. That's just. That's just. That's just, that's just that's 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 guy that played Sabretooth? Yeah. Some guy? I'm yeah. told, yeah. yeah. I, don't see it. I just remember he was with Woman and Doom. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and, and he, he took some bumps from the Steiners when yeah. they finally let him yeah. do stuff. Well, he was uh, the Gaspar brother, remember? He was a giant Gaspar brother. Remember, it was Bob Orton Jr. and Daryl Carolette were the Gaspar yeah. brothers. Wow. So that was the first I would have seen of him. And I had no idea. Daryl Carolette, who the hell is that? Yeah, that's crazy. And then he became, you know, partners with Butch Masters on that yeah. one tour with Andre and Baba. The land of the giants, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah, that horrible match. And they had a match with the Headhunters. Yeah. Or not, the Undertakers, I'm sorry. The two little chubby guys. Oh, the, 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 yeah, yeah, the IWCCW guys. Yeah. They, they probably got good bank. I, I, I think I brought this up to Demond. Oh, because, because, they, because, they, because they got the, the, they they the Undertaker name in the WWE. Right, right. Jesus. Was one of them Val Puccio? They were not. Yeah, Val and Tony Puccio. Oh, they were. Val and Tony Puccio. Yeah. But Sal, I used to think Val Puccio and Sally Graziano were the same dude. No, no, like no, no, no. Yeah. Sally Graziano was way bigger. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, what, uh, yeah, so, where do we go from there? No, 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 no. I have... Uh, <laughs> there was... Um, uh, so I, when I go to Japan, I go to the wrestling shops and look at magazines and whatever. And in a lot of the histories of different companies or whatever, for some reason, there's oftentimes just like a page or a sidebar of wrestlers that just never made it. So, you know, like like uh, I remember one with that's got Land of the Giants. It's got the Black Hearts on there. It had... Firecat, which I think was a Brady Boone gimmick. Yes, and I'm just he, so he went, he went to all Japan. Yeah, so I'm fascinated. I'm always like looking at these and like, who is this person? And then Masahori is always like, why you ask about shit wrestler? Always. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know when when I went to, when I went to Japan, I think the fir the first time we were we you know we just walk around right mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. like all the all the all the magazine stores had like all, wrestling magazines. Yeah. But we went to one store that had like these back issues of the old magazines from the 70s yeah. and it was like so fascinating yeah. to see you know before I started following yeah. the Japanese Cause, wrestling because there were so many they came out weekly there's so many of well, them well then then they were monthly yeah but they were they were but 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 the monthlies were huge it weren't like they were like much bigger and um, and the monthlies had like Madison Square Garden Olympic Auditoriums mm -hmm. Kiel Auditorium like all of that stuff was covered mm -hmm. and that's why like um, so many of the guys that would come to Japan in the '70s, mm -hmm. um, you know, they got over from the from the photos. Yeah, like Mel Moskowitz was over like day one. Yeah, you know, Freddie Blassie was over like day one because they were main eventers in Los Angeles type mm -hmm. of thing. Uh, I just uh, found an old Japanese wrestling magazine from the '70s. I got it on eBay for like ten bucks or whatever, and it has a fold out poster of they, they Andre. Were, yeah, it's got Andre the, the, the Giant book. doing a tombstone, but it says. Toonstone, T O U N oh, Stone really? Driver. So it's just like a, him doing a very poor. I actually have a t shirt of Andre the Giant doing a tombstone. But I didn't even know they used that word then. Yeah. So, I, knew, I knew he did it. Yeah. I seen pictures so, of it. Uh, so I, I, I think I'm right on this also where it's. But he was Monster Rusimov at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Andre broke a guy's neck with a tombstone. Oh, really? And then that was the last time he ever did it. He was doing it for, oh. for a little while. Uh, was it was he wrestling the movie Strong Kobayashi or the IWE the early yeah. the early tour? Yeah, because I, I remember asking about that. I was like, Andre did a tombstone? That's so weird. Yeah, Monster Rusimov and Don Leo Jonathan and all them. Yeah. God, don't we have a first time move question for Dave? Didn't we like see a oh there it is. There's wow. the, show the there camera is. The tombstone. Wow. There it is. That's a thing. It, yeah. Uh so 
we always talk about who's the first person to do this move or that move. Last year, obviously, we talked about Scott Steiner innovating the 450. I guess the great Wojo in 1987 in Detroit. The 450, really? Yeah, you. Yeah, I forgot one already. And a half yeah, Superfly. They called it the oh, one yeah, and a half Superfly. Yeah. He hits him with the you, one. He goes said, one and a half Superfly. You sent me the, t- the, yeah. the clip. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. right. Yeah, that's fine. So like. This Firecat, by the way. Firecat. Fire Look at that. That's it's super bad, Bradley, for sure. A little more musculature. Uh, so okay, let's think. We talked about Lanny Poppo and the uh, oh the moonsault. Yeah, yeah, the moonsault, or what did he call it? He called it the uh, rounding press. Or well, rounding press was when he, he, yeah. when Mudo oh, did Tiger it before. Man. It was he called it a rounding press when Mudo did it before they they called it a moonsault. Yeah, so Lanny Poppo, man. How'd you how'd you I, forget the name already? You yeah, said you were I know. Gonna call it's it that. Crazy, forever. I know. I just got a. It's a good thing we have technology. Yeah, so Jesus, how do I not remember what it's called? Uh, but regardless, like Lanny Poffo. Yep, we're bringing him up. Lanny Poffo, I think he had such. I think he's an underrated guy in wrestling because. In some ways. I think with the Poffo territory, I think he had a lot to do with obviously the promotion. and the, He was almost like Jim Cornette in that a way. Was a, like, that he, was a crazy promotion. Though. Yeah, I, I, I think he was the glue that made it all work. Well, he was. He, no, when, when we because we got that we got their tapes in San Francisco for a little while, and and you know Lanny and Randy were the two big stars. Lanny yeah. was the top babyface, Randy was the top heel, and it was they did an angle, and I, I knew Lanny Poffo, and I knew there was a Randy Poffo, but I didn't know Randy Poffo was Randy Savage. Yeah. And when they did the angle where they revealed that Randy Savage was really Randy Poffo, Ronnie Garvin, yeah, yeah, it like freaked me out. It's going like because because it's like when I'm watching Randy Savage, and it's just like. Who the hell is this guy? It was like that was almost a freak out thing because he was doing that elbow, mm-hmm. and nobody did the elbow like him, and no he way. flew way up there, you know, like Okada does now, yeah. maybe even better, but yeah. about the same probably. And and Kari Hojo though, yeah, her elbow is yeah, ridiculous. Kari Hojo. She brings yeah. it up, just the four. Well, and, and it's not even it's the legs. It's the it's legs because too. she kicks her legs up into the side. It's just looks, it just looks so crazy. There's so many good girls in stardom right yeah. now, and I'm not going oh, yeah. too far into it. And then obviously, you know. Well, Stardom, Stardom, they got that streaming thing now. It's great. I thoroughly yeah. enjoy it. I think yeah. there's so many really good girls there, and then obviously Satomura comes in for big shows. And she's so good. Yeah. Miko Satomura might be the best wrestler, wrestler in the world. You know, I don't see that much stuff for her that makes tape, but like she's she's been good for so long too. Everything's so crisp. She was good like twenty years ago. She was good like twenty years ago. Yeah. And it's just like her capo kicks, everything she does. The sky, the sky drop. drop. Oh, okay. What year was that? That's uh, 1982 or 83. He was doing he was doing it before that. Because mm-hmm. I remember he would do... The sky he, drop. That was he, beautiful. Because he credited Tiger Mask. Cause he, but someone, Tiger Mask did it a different yeah, way. With, yeah. yeah, or yeah. he would just go up and... But Lanny, when the first time I saw Lanny do it, it's like he'd have one foot on the second, middle rope and one, one foot on the top, top yeah. and he flipped I, When backwards. he was the genius, I remember him doing that a couple times. Yeah. I also remember watching a tape of Jake Roberts versus Lanny, maybe from the garden. Yeah. Oh, and Lanny Lord. tried the springboard oh. to the floor and he tucks and flips and then Jake just looks dies like, a painful yeah. death on the floor the Be- springboard who's the first person you ever saw do a springboard I don't know but Otani was the one that I remember you know that sticks into yeah. my into my head um, in, was that being the 80s because Ultimo Dragon was the, was one of the first guys I saw do that but they were doing it in Mexico long before Ultimo Dragon yeah. I remember he Al Snow first... saying that in 93, 94 Al Snow kind of popularized it here because yeah. he started Al Snow did it saw his Otani match with there Benoit there. from ECW yeah, yeah and a lot of those Sabu tapes but but I think I think that in Mexico they may have done it long before that but I don't I couldn't tell you who would be the first yeah, ones to do it in Mexico either. in in, in Japan they their word for a springboard is swan dive Right. Mm, yeah. Right. Springboard is called a swan dive. Yeah. Yeah. That was Martell's yeah. finish, wasn't it? Yeah. When he would be outside the ring and spring in and do a splash, wasn't mm-hmm. it called the swan dive? Rick Martell in AWA when he's a champ, he'd go up maybe. Over. Maybe. Bam Bam then took it in WWF, and I thought yeah. that was always really impressive. Is the, would... it, so, it, just when when I started getting into Japanese wrestling, and I'm I'm just like, why do they call every suplex a brainbuster? Like, I don't, I don't get. But yeah, they just, just did. Was it Killer Carl Cox? Killer, from Killer Carl Cox. And then and after a while, they're just like, oh yeah, it's a brain buster. Yeah, but I, Mur- I mean, Mur- Murdoch, Murdoch like popularized it. Because, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but, but race when race did it, it was vertical suplex. Yeah. You know, because I remember the old tapes yeah. of the Funks and everybody, and it was vertical suplex. But then it turned everything turned into brain buster. Yeah. And in Mexico, they call every arm drag a suplex. 
da 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 suplex, suplex, suplex. What kind of suplex? You know, you know what I thought was, was was crazy? You know, that spin under arm drag that used mm-hmm. to be called the Mexican arm drag and Japanese arm yeah. drag? Yeah. I always thought, like, I never seen it in Mexico or Japan. <laughs> 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 or the Japanese arm drag. Yeah, you know, Which is... Morton, yeah. Ricky Morton. You don't, yeah. Yeah. you don't see those anymore. And no. that's a cool move. Yeah. I'd like to see a tag team do it where someone Mexican arm drags someone yeah. into a senton. Yeah. You know the one that my, my favorite move, and um, the first, I finally saw somebody doing it was Chad Gable recently on mm-hmm. in NXT, was that Red Bastine head scissors. When I was a kid. Oh, oh the yeah. Steamboat Bastine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When I was a kid, when I was a kid watching Red Bastine, mm-hmm. and he would he would do it, he would do the head scissors. Like a lot of guys did flying head scissors, which nobody does now. Yeah. Um, you know, Murdoch would do it and everything. But Red Bastine, he would, he would like the guy would kind of duck mm-hmm. under so he could jump yeah. up and, and head scissor him. And then he would get up and he would like, almost like ballet, yeah. and then flip him yeah. over, and it was like the coolest so thing. Graceful, like yeah. Do you think Rocka ever did that? I'm sure, he did. it I seems like a Rocka move. Maybe I don't know, but I remember I, I asked Bastine about it, and, and he said like he tried to train people to do it, and they would always keep falling down. Yeah, it's it's. But just, I, I, I was ba- like the basing on something like that is very important. Yeah, I always thought like like that would be a great move for Ray. Yeah, you know, but he never did it, you know. So. Yeah. I always like move origins. I remember we sat with the destroyer at one of the cauliflower alleys, and he had. He was so who, like, who, who was the first guy to do the figure four leg lock? Oh Jesus! Was it maybe it was, I, maybe it was Buddy Rogers? I don't know. I would assume Buddy Rogers, but yeah. I certainly won't know. I, I I do know that obviously Jack, because again the the stupid story of me saying the Buddy Landell way to get into a figure four to Jerry Briscoe. He's like, oh Jerry Jack Briscoe oh, way to get. I'm like, yeah, I'm sorry, yeah. but uh, I like I always like the way you could go into that. Oh Ricky Lee Jones or Ricky Gibson. Would do the old. He'd put you in the uh, like a step over to hold step over to hold and then bridge, bridge back. backwards. Yeah. They need to bring yeah. that back. That, that That's was a really cool pinning combination. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I yeah. love like fun pinning combinations that other people haven't done or they've not been done since. Like when La Mahi Straw came out, that was like such a hot right, movie. right, right, right. And it's still protected today in Japan to some degree too, yeah. which is good. Uh, this uh, is a is a stupid little thing that I see on Twitter all the time. Is uh, the abbreviation for indie for independent? Uh-huh. Uh, there's, there's I use I N D Y and people. I'm a got Y in my guy, case. yeah. It's so good right? in my case. So oh. I personally use I N D Y just because that's what I do and that's what I've done. I do realize that, like for instance, King of the Indies is I N D I E S. Yeah, there, there's no problem with that. But it's an abbreviation. I don't think some people get really, really upset about it. I, I, I used it about yeah, a week ago, and people just got so mad about it, and it was like I didn't even realize that it it's, was any big. Deal. If you're typing, it's one less letter. Yeah. So. <laughs> I, I don't know. Maybe you're just yeah. trying to save time, but I, I don't know. So it's an. I don't think there's a proper grammar with certain abbreviations <laughs> like that. Yeah, I don't think it matters. I'm okay with the Y. I'm not getting yeah. too mad at it. Yeah. I think there's other horrible things happening in the world. That <laughs> I E or Y really is. Yeah. I'm not I think get maybe too I, 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 I'm from Ohio, so I grew up next to Indiana. Yeah. And there's an Indy 500, so I think maybe that's why it's in my yeah, brain yeah, more right. often. Yeah, I'll worry um, more about like famine and, back, <laughs> and maybe some hurricanes in the southern region of the states. Nail are really concerned about famine. I'll tell you what, I care really. so much. Like, God damn it. I will remember the old. Uh, <laughs> this is nothing new. Wrestling. Remember you get the old milk cartons and you give the gimmicks to the kids in Ethiopia and stuff back in the eighties. Yeah, 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 yeah. Those are great. I, I think you're confusing. <laughs> I, milk cartons are for missing kids. <laughs> no man. Ethiopia are like commercials Look, in the on little TV. Catholic school that Rob Taylor went to. We get the little, uh, the little miniature milk cartons and you S- put in like S- a nickel. S- Sally, like, yeah. Sally Struthers. Yeah, Sally motherfucking Struthers, and yeah. you give them. You give the little. Uh, yeah, the, I remember. I remember the yeah, nickel. Yeah, I've yeah, yeah, always yeah, been a. I, I love. Yeah. I really. I don't like the homeless situation and I, I really always I care a lot for the, the yeah. kids uh, so let's think others st- I, I have an opinion question I, I'm gonna state mine first and then see what you think um, because you're probably the, the best person to to give his thought on it um, I think it's become more lenient in you know maybe the past 10 years or so but the the what's the attitude that some wrestlers have Versus non wrestlers and their opinions. How it's the whole it, it, at a it, at its stupidest point. It's like if you've never taken a bump, you can't da 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 whatever. There are some things that people write and review that don't have the same context for. Well, there's but, things that there's things that your knowledge of yeah. being a wrestler that you're yeah because 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 like if if there's like a move that's dangerous, yeah. I always ask a wrestler because it's like I don't have yeah. the knowledge. I mean, yeah. sometimes stuff looks just terrible. And maybe it's not, yeah. right? Yeah, and it's just like uh, the the new era. Oh, this guy's unsafe and whatever. Like, do you know or does it just look really good? Maybe, <laughs> maybe he is unsafe. Maybe he isn't. There are certain things like that. But 
the whole attitude of these the fans supply your livelihood. Right. They make it so that you can wrestle, they buy tickets and whatever, and it's just the adi- the, the, the I'm here, you're here, that attitude. It, I just don't understand it and it, I think it has softened though. What I what I think it comes from, I think it comes from insecurities and just perhaps uh, the old embarrassment of the stigma of pro wrestling. Like, the the general common folk are, you know, see wrestling as this silly thing, and then now I've gotten into this silly thing, so, like, I'm here and these people are... I, I don't know. Wh- wh- where do you think that comes from? Why, why is that attitude so staunch? Well, before, it, it was, it was like... Um, I don't. I, I think that wrestlers thought that the only people who knew wrestling were wrestlers. Yeah. You know. So. So. And everybody else, they were all you know marks or whatever like that. Yeah. But the one like it, it's like um, when they when they when they talk about like you like to book you have to be a wrestler. Yeah. And I just keep thinking, well, what about all the bookers that, that or all the promoters? Like, okay, you don't know wrestling unless you've wrestled. And I think Sam Mushnick ran wrestling or Vince yeah. Senior. Yeah. And you know they never you know I mean and it, it, it's like it just doesn't. If you think about it, it doesn't add up. It's like, it'd be like, oh, well, you can't write a movie unless you've written a movie. Yeah, or you... Wait, can, what? You it can't... But, well, here's one. It's a story. You, you, you can't review food unless you've been a chef. And yeah. it's like, I know if the food tastes bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, what, what, do you, what do you think it is, Naylor? Where, where does that Man, come from? I don't well, know. Well, you, 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 you probably got it worse than me because I was always on the outside. I mean, you're on the inside. Here's the weird thing. When I was there, everyone was super nice and polite. Like, William Regal, he won't... There, I'll, I'll say this. It. I'll say this. Um... There are certain people that meet you and go, "Oh, Naylor, you know, he's he's he likes the fancy wrestling and whatever. He doesn't really know what he's talking about or whatever." But in your two years there, how many people came around on you? People that were just kind of arms oh, length. Yeah, I want exactly. everyone over. So, but but that's that's how it works. It's yeah. like, oh, I don't value this person's I opinion. Think, and then somebody goes, "Hey, what would you think of the match? If Naylor likes yeah. the match, it was a good match." Yeah, I think it's just all delivery. You know, yeah. I mean, I've 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 norm. I'd say like eighty five percent of the time, yeah. I've had really great interactions, person to person. Like I've had some bad ones, you know, by developmentally speaking, from yeah. Dallas and see that one. But like I think for the most part, I think things have yeah. been really good as far as yeah. me giving feedback. But I'll always defer to the wrestler no matter yeah. what. Like I didn't take bumps, so I'm not going to argue. But but here's the thing, though. It's like but I'm also not as great. a wrestler, you can be out of touch and you can have a match that you need someone else's perspective yeah. to go. What went wrong? What could we have done? And once you cut yourself off from that, yeah. you learn. You lose that opportunity to get better. And I'm not saying like. I, you have to create a filter as a as a professional wrestler. You have to create a filter because you're going to get critiques and compliments and what. So you have to know when somebody gives you a compliment and it's not there is of no value. Then you have to know when someone gives you criticism and it is of value. Mm-hmm. Or then when somebody gives you multi layered criticism and you go like, well, I don't agree with this, but I need that. Yeah. So there, you have to. You can't just go, oh, the dirt sheets are the shits, or this mm-hmm. guy, the, the guy, all the all the people that they're in their mother's basement and whatever, like all these terrible things that they're, they're not even amusing. Yeah, you know? I think it's a fair balance thing. I think there's a certain level of human beings that watch wrestling that just like to complain and moan about everything. Yeah. You just gotta, you gotta isolate those and not listen yeah. to them. Yeah. And then yeah. I think the people that, my thing, if I ever am critical of anything to anyone that asks me on my opinion, yeah. I'll throw out a compliment first, kind of like, then guide my way and then suggest perhaps you should have done this or this. Yeah. Just a su- I think the word suggestion in wrestling well, it, well, is so good real quick, just the not worst like telling you you need to do this. The, it's a suggestion. The use of the word should there instead yeah. of could. Yeah. That's such a, a psychological thing like, hey, you should have done this. Yeah. You well, what the fuck? Do you know better than me? I don't know. Sure. And when you say should, you don't know. Yeah. But when you say, hey, maybe could. you could have done this, yeah. maybe, just the difference of that word mm-hmm. changes things. Oh, sure. And it's I, I think when people are oh this is the this match was better than that match as opposed to saying I like In this match opinion. better oh, than that. Oh, but I mean match. like yeah. especially like when when you're like arguing a, a quarter store and it's like what is this? Yeah. Well, I mean, what, it's, it's it, like, it, when, when it goes, we're, we're in the same ballpark, yeah. and it's not even like an argument. Yeah. When it's one thing when it goes from debate, and you're just honestly, oh, I like this, and I did. Oh, what do you think about? This? But when you go, no, man, that matches. This match is definitely better. It's just so. Well, no, I think it's small no, minded because yeah, it's yeah. less work to think about it, and you just write something off. It's on, silly. on that note, we're gonna close this one out. Dave, thanks yep. for doing it. Chris, you're the man. Thank you. Uh, this has been hitting the high spots. 
Nailer, Meltzer, and Hero. Check it out on. Oh, you, got a, you got a big egg. You got a Tokyo Dome shirt. The Archman 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 Women's. Wow. Yeah. Archman uh, Women's. I did. And Pete the shirt. Get a get a zoom in on this one. This is a. There we go. Big a egg. Lovely shirt. We'll end with this one. Look at that shirt. <laughs> and look at them guns. Mm. Mm. See you next time, guys. Yeah. No, I brought this especially because of uh, the the Women's Tokyo Dome shirt. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Very. That